immediate aftermath of the attack on the U.S. Capitol. No matter the circumstances, the committee and the American people have benefited from the witnesses' frank assessment of the threats facing the homeland, both foreign and domestic. More than 20 years after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, and 20 years this month since the Department of Homeland Security was established in law, we recognize the witnesses, their predecessors, and men and women of their agencies for their tireless efforts to prevent another 9-11 style attack. That said, we know the threat posed by foreign terrorist organizations has not gone away. It has evolved and persisted, just as our efforts to combat it have. At the same time, domestic violent extremists now pose the greatest threat to our homeland. The Biden administration has put new focus on combating the rising threat, issuing the first ever national strategy for countering domestic terrorism, establishing a domestic terrorism analytic branch within DHS's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, and designating domestic violent extremism as a national priority area for Homeland Security grants. More work remains as extremists are increasingly willing to engage in targeted violence, whether at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, a Walmart in El Paso, or a supermarket in Buffalo. I hope to speak to our, our witnesses today about their assessment of the current threat from our terrorism and targeted violence and what their agencies are doing to protect the homeland. Beyond terrorism, I remain concerned about cyber threats, particularly from Russia, China, and Iran. In response to these threats, the Biden administration has raised our cybersecurity posture by issuing an executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity, leading global efforts to confront ransomware threats, and launching a groundbreaking public-private collaboration to help secure industrial control systems. I want to hear from our witnesses about how they assess the current threat to cyber and critical infrastructure, what progress we've made, and what more we can do. Meanwhile, other Homeland Security challenges remain, like preparing for natural disasters, dealing with climate change, responding to the pandemic, securing our skies and waterways, addressing the increased number of migrants arriving at our borders, and protecting our very democracy and its institutions. Our discussion will undoubtedly touch on many of these issues today, and I look forward to a robust and respectful dialogue. As the 117th Congress draws to a close, I want to take a moment to reflect on the committee's work over the last two years, because together we've accomplished a great deal. Today marks the 25th full committee hearing this Congress, and our subcommittees have held more than 50 hearings, conducting oversight on some of the most pressing homeland security issues facing our nation. We enacted critical legislation, particularly in the areas of cybersecurity, creating a mandatory cyber incident reporting framework, providing cybersecurity grants to state and local governments, and improving the federal government's visibility into malicious activity on industrial control systems. Historically, much of this committee's best work and many of its greatest successes have been the result of strong bipartisan effort. That has certainly been true uh, this Congress with the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko, as ranking member. Early in his time on this committee, ranking member Katko became a leader and innovator on aviation security, and more recently, he was made, he's made his mark on the committee's cybersecurity work. Perhaps most importantly, he was a true partner on efforts to stand up a commission to examine the January 6th attack on the Capitol, putting country before politics. The ranking member and I did not always agree, but we agreed when we could, and when we disagreed, we tried not to be disagreeable about it. As he departs Congress, I want to thank him for his important work over the years on this committee and on a personal note for his friendship. I wish him the very best in the new year and beyond. 
Likewise, I want to extend my thanks to all members for their work in the 117th Congress, and especially those who are moving on to other endeavors next year. The gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Rice. The gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Demons. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Malinowski. The gentlewoman from Virginia, Mrs. Luria. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Meyer. And the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Flores. Your contribution to this committee's work, uh, this Congress, and throughout your tenure are recognized and appreciated. Again, I thank the witnesses for being here, and I look forward to the hearing. With that, I recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm pleased that the committee is holding this important hearing. I think it's vitally important to look at these issues on a routine basis, and we've always done that. As our nation faces these growing and continuous changing threats posed by foreign adversaries, criminal and terror organizations, and the crisis at the southwest border, to name a few. In the first two years of the Biden administration, we have seen a disturbing trend become a catastrophic humanitarian crisis at the border. In 2020, CBP had 500,000 migrant encounters at the southwest border. In 2021, the first year of the Biden administration and the poll magnets they created, these migrants are, encounters have tripled to well over 1.7 million. And in the last fiscal year, Customs and Border Protection reported a record-breaking 2.3 million migrant encounters. Mr. Ray, I know you at FBI, that's got to be a concern for you. While the vast majority of these migrants may be coming to find work or more prosperous opportunities, we cannot ignore the evident security threat that looms beneath the surface of that crisis. CBP reported over 29,000 illegal immigrants who have known criminal records and 751 documented gang members including 312 affiliated with the notorious MS-13 gang were among those encountered at the southwest border. Those are the ones we know about, not the ones we don't. Even more troubling is that these numbers only count for those that were located by law enforcement, not the 600,000 that are estimated to have evaded officers at the border in 2022 alone. How many dangerous criminals and gang members entered undetected? How many were smuggling deadly drugs like fentanyl into our communities? The truth is we have no way of knowing, but these reports demonstrate it is almost certainly an elevated and fast-growing number. In addition, a still darker threat lies within the data and something that's central to our mission here at Homeland Security. In two, 2020, CBP located three individuals, three, who were on a terrorist screening data set or watch list attempting to enter the U.S. along the southwest border ports of entry. These were deemed to be a potential threat to our homeland, including known or suspected terrorists or their affiliates. In 2021, the number grew to 15. In the last reported year, 98 potential terrorists or affiliates were discovered between our ports of entry, attempting to evade law enforcement and enter the country. Again, that's just the ones we know about. Sadly, the increased risk to our nation's security is not the only consequence of this crisis. The migrants attempting, to pa attempting passage are also experiencing brutal conditions that I saw firsthand, including child exploitation, rape, and death. The UN International Organization for Migration has labeled the southwest border as, quote, the deadliest land crossing in the world, end quote, and migrant deaths for 2022 are reported to be over 850, breaking the grim record for deaths set just last year. There are counties in Texas and in Arizona and California where they've had to cut their budgets to deal with the number of dead bodies they encounter on the border. Encounter on the border. But I, I don't understand that. We are reminded of these tragedies almost daily with reports of families drowning in the Rio Grande River or dying of heat exhaustion crossing the inhospitable desert, often abandoned by smugglers who care only about profits. I would like to recognize the brave men and women who stand guard at our nation's borders, constantly under siege by drug cartels, human smugglers, and this ever-increasing humanitarian crisis. These honorable, brave Americans work day and night Holidays and weekends are some of the most unforgiving environments, and I know, Secretary Mayorkas, you know that for sure. They routinely face danger and even death, all while being villainized by some for fulfilling their duties to protect our homeland from those that wish us harm. In this difficult position, it is truly tragic but unsurprising that many of them bear scars, both mental and physical, from the burden that they shoulder. My heart goes out to the families of the heroic men and women that have given all protecting our country, 
as well as those that suffer the mental toll of prolonged exposure to this crisis, including the alarming rise in the number of suicides amongst these, amongst these agents who are despondent. Another threat to our country illuminated by the Inspector General last year was a vetting shortfall experienced during the evacuation and resettlement of more than 79,000 Afghans as part of Operation Allies Refuge and Operation Allies Welcome. It has now become even ever clearer that the Biden administration facilitated the transfer and relocation into the U.S. of many Afghans that were known at the time to have potentially significant security concerns. Both Homeland Security and the Department of Defense IGs found that information used to vet evacuees was not complete, reliable, or always accurate. We understand it was a fire drill. We understand we had to protect those who helped us, but we have to do better with vetting refugees. And I'm a very strong sport having refugees coming into our country because I think they are properly vetted by and large. We must also not lose sight of the challenges to our virtual borders. State-sponsored cyber actors continue to utilize a cyber environment to penetrate computer networks for espionage, suppression campaigns, the spread of disinformation, and to steal intellectual property and technology to bolster their own defenses at the expense of industry, government, and everyday Americans. We must remain vigilant to the efforts of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, to name a few, who seek advantage in tactical capabilities in the virtual environment that bring risk to our security. In addition to state-sponsored adversaries, organized criminal cyber thieves devise formidable attacks and fraud schemes. Ransomware attacks were up 188% in 2021, costing businesses an estimated $1.2 billion, and were focused on schools and healthcare organizations primarily including many in my district. I look forward to the collective insight of our witnesses today on how we can further address the most prevalent and concerning cyber threats impacting both our communities and national security. Additionally, along with many Americans, I'm sad to say that I'm very concerned about reporting that an FBI agent, Timothy Tebow, I said that correctly, may have suppressed derogatory information relevant to ongoing investigations relating to Hunter Biden and has a long history of partisanship and he was quickly uh, left the agency uh, when these allegations came to light. As a career law enforcement professional, I know I found these re revelations to be deeply troubling, as did many others in law enforcement. Similarly, Mr. Ray, you have publicly acknowledged, and I applaud you for that, that you were troubled by the allegations at a recent Senate Judiciary hearing. While today's hearing is focused primarily on threats to the homeland security, I have to say I'm concerned about the overall state of the Bureau and the increasingly partisan perception, right or wrong, of the Bureau. And I say that from someone who for 20 years uh, worked day and night on the highest and most violent and dangerous criminals in the world as a federal organized crime prosecutor in El Paso, Texas, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in upstate New York. And every time I had FBI agents by my side, they did the best wiretaps, they did the best organized crime cases, they were by far uh, what I consider to be the A-team when he did those major cases. And I know those agents, because they're still friends of mine, are heartbroken by the perception of the FBI today. And I hope in the days and years going forward that you can turn that ship around because our nation deserves it. And when nation lose, and our nation loses um, faith in law enforcement, that's a terrible thing. And you are the premier law enforcement agency, and I hope you can turn the ship around. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you alluded to, this is in all likelihood my last full committee with this hearing. And of all the decisions I've had to make about whether to retire or not, this was the toughest one, by far. Because I've had more joy and more satisfaction with this agency because it was like a bastion of bipartisanship. Uh, we don't conduct a lot of the antics and the cheap theatrics a lot of the other eight, uh, committees do. We get our job done because we care about this nation, whether we're Republican or a Democrat. And we love our nation. And we want to keep it safe. And I commend you for the time that you've been chairman and the way you've conducted yourself and the way we've become friends and the way we've been able to keep our eyes focused on the mission despite all the partisan rancor that seems to be higher than ever these days. So good for you for what you've done for this committee and good for all of you members here who have put your partisanship aside when we come in this room and do what's right for this country. And that to me is a very important thing. We may often disagree and sometimes even strongly, Mr. Chairman, but I believe this committee has demonstrated our passion for securing the country's bipartisan and steadfast. And I want to thank my committee staff, who have spent countless hours developing oversight legislation and policy to secure the United States from all manner of threats. I'm incredibly grateful for their service and dedication to the mission. Many of them are with me here today, 
and I'm not going to single them all out, but there's one I will single out. Uh, this person has been with me from the beginning. He's now my staff director. Uh, the entire eight years I've been in Congress, I've worked with him uh, side by side on Homeland Security Matters, and it's Kyle Klein, who's right behind me. And I want to say thank you to him. He has been a, a true professional. He's a bipartisan person. He cares about this country and loves this country and wants to keep it safe. So, Kyle, thank you very much, and I just want to say thank you to him. <clears throat> and with that happy note, uh, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back, and obviously, uh, I already expressed my um, thoughts on your leadership as well as uh, the members who will be departing. And uh, thank you much. Other members of the committee are reminded that under committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Members are also reminded that the committee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in our February 3rd, 2021 colloquy regarding remote procedures. I welcome our panel of witnesses. Our first witness is Alejandro Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security. Our next witness will be Christopher Ray, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And our third and final witness will be Christine Avizade, Director of the National Counterterrorism Center. Without objection, the witness's full statement will be included in the record. I now ask Secretary Mayorkas to summarize his statement for five minutes. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, distinguished members of this committee, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. Next week, marks the 20th anniversary of the Homeland Security Act being signed into law. This act brought together many components of the federal government to safeguard the United States against foreign terrorism in the wake of the devastation wrought on September 11th, 2001. It remains the largest reorganization of the federal government's national security establishment since 1947. It is a testament to the grave threat we faced as a nation from terrorism brought to our shores by foreign actors and foreign terrorist organizations. Congress created a department that has significantly reduced the foreign terrorism threat posed to the homeland. Mr. Secretary, will you pull your mic a little closer to you? How's that? Well, <laughs> all right, let's see how that goes. Congress created a department that has significantly reduced the risk foreign terrorism poses to the homeland by increasing our capacity to prepare for and respond to those events. Foreign terrorist organizations remain committed to attacking the United States from within and beyond our borders. They use social media platforms to amplify messaging intended to inspire attacks in the homeland. They have adapted to changing security environments, seeking new and innovative ways to target the United States. The evolving terrorism threat to the homeland now includes lone actors fueled by a wide range of violent extremist ideologies and grievances, including domestic violent extremists, U.S.-based individuals who seek to further political or social goals wholly or in part through violence, without direction or inspiration from a foreign terrorist group or foreign power. From cyber attacks on our critical infrastructure to increasing destabilizing efforts by hostile nation states, the threats facing the homeland have never been greater or more complex. Flouting internationally accepted norms of responsible behavior in cyberspace, our adversaries, hostile nations and non-nation state cyber criminals continue to advance in capability and sophistication. Their methods vary, but their goals of doing harm are the same. Hostile nations like Russia, the People's Republic of China, Iran and North Korea, and cyber criminals around the world continue to sharpen their tactics and create more adverse consequences. Their ransomware attacks target our financial institutions, hospitals, pipelines, electric grids, and water treatment plants attempting to wreak havoc on our daily lives. They exploit the integrated global cyber ecosystem to sow discord, undermine democracy, and erode trust in our institutions, public and private. These cyber operations threaten the economic and national security of every American and many others around the world. In particular, China is using its technology to tilt the global playing field to its benefit. 
They leverage sophisticated cyber capabilities to gain access to the intellectual property, data, and infrastructure of American individuals and businesses. Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine intensified the risk of a cyber attack, impacting our critical infrastructure earlier this year. Nation-state aggression is creating a heightened risk of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear-related threats to Americans as well. While fast-emerging technologies like unmanned aerial systems, artificial intelligence, internet communications, and cryptocurrencies are helping societies be more productive, creative, and entrepreneurial, they also are introducing new risks. Transnational criminal organizations are deploying these technologies to commit a wide array of crimes as they continue to grow in size, scale, sophistication, and lethality. With respect to unmanned aerial systems in particular, it is vital that Congress act before the end of this year to extend our CUAS authorities in order to protect the American people from malicious drone activity. The risk of targeted violence perpetrated by actors abroad and at home is substantial. Emerging technology platforms allow individuals and nation states to fan the flames of hate and personal grievances to large audiences and are encouraging people to commit violent acts. Those driven to violence are targeting critical infrastructure, soft targets, faith-based institutions, institutions of higher education, racial and religious minorities, government facilities and personnel, including law enforcement and the military, and perceived ideological opponents. Addressing these threats requires a whole of society approach across federal, state, and local governments, the private sector, nonprofits, academia, and most importantly, every citizen. Congress may not have predicted the extent of today's threat environment when our department was created 20 years ago, but our mission has never been more vital. Our components have never collaborated more closely. Our extraordinary workforce has never been more capable, and our nation has never been more prepared. We must harness the same deliberative and bipartisan spirit in which this department was created to combat the vast threats Americans face today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Director Ray to summarize his statement for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, members of the committee. I'm honored to be here today on behalf of the FBI's 38,000 men and women to discuss some of the most pressing threats facing our homeland. When it comes to our current threat landscape, what makes our current situation, at least in my career, unique is, and particularly serious, I would add, is the fact that we have so many different threat areas all elevated at the same time. And I'm proud of the work that the FBI's agents, analysts, and professional staff are doing all over the country and all over the world every single day to rise to those challenges and to protect the American people. Protecting the American people from terrorist attack remains the FBI's number one priority. As I've said before, the greatest threat we face on the terrorism front here in the homeland is from what are effectively lone actors or small cells. Whether it's a domestic violent extremist acting in furtherance of some ideological goal or a homegrown violent extremist looking to advance the interests of a foreign terrorist organization, these actors often move quickly from radicalization to action and often use easily obtainable weapons, think a gun, a knife, a car, a crude IED, against soft targets, which is just intelligence community speak for everyday people living everyday lives. Overseas, ISIS and Al-Qaeda still aim to inspire, to plan, and to launch attacks against the United States and our allies, both abroad and here at home. As the Zawahiri strike this summer in Kabul reinforces the threat of foreign terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda attempting to reconstitute in Afghanistan following our withdrawal remains very real. And our ability to gather valuable intelligence on the ground inside Afghanistan has been reduced. And that's just a reality. All of that places a premium on our continued collaboration with our partners, both within the US government and internationally. We've got to stay on the balls of our feet 
and use all of the tools available to us. On top of that, countries like China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are growing more aggressive, brazen, and capable. They're coming at us from all angles to undermine our core democratic institutions, our national security, and our rule of law. Of those countries, the greatest long-term threat to our nation's ideas, innovation, and economic security, our national security, is that from China. The Chinese government aspires to equal or surpass the U.S. as a global superpower and influence the world with a value system shaped by undemocratic authoritarian ideals. But we are confronting that threat head on. Just three weeks ago, for example, we unsealed charges against 13 individuals, 10 of them Chinese intelligence officers and government officials, for a variety of criminal efforts to exert influence right here in the U.S. to benefit Beijing. And the FBI has scores of investigations open into the China threat in all 56 of our field offices. On the cyber front, China's vast hacking program is the world's largest, and they have stolen more of Americans' personal and business data than every other nation combined. But of course, China is not our only challenge in cyberspace, not even close. The FBI's cyber investigations are growing in frequency, scale, and complexity consistent with the evolution of the threat. We're investigating over 100 different ransomware variants, and each one of those with scores of victims, as well as a whole host of other novel threats posed by both cyber criminals and nation states alike. And it's becoming more and more difficult to discern where the cyber criminal activity ends and the nation state activity begins as the line between those two continues to blur. Just last month, for example, we announced the indictment of three Iranian nationals for their roles in a multi-year scheme to compromise the networks of hundreds of organizations, many of which offer services Americans rely on every day. To those sorts of actors, nothing is off limits. Not even, for example, Boston Children's Hospital, which they set their sights on in the summer of 2021. Now, fortunately, before they could successfully launch their attack, we received a tip from a partner, and working closely with the hospital, we were able to identify and defeat the threat, protecting both the network and the sick children who depend on it. Our opponents in this space are relentless, so we've got to keep responding in kind. And I can assure you that we're going to continue to be aggressive and creative as we run joint sequenced operations with our partners against these adversaries, removing their malware, taking down their botnets, and hunting them down all over the world. Now, that's just a snapshot of some of the many threats we're tackling and doesn't even include things like our efforts to combat violent crime, where this summer, working with our state and local partners, we arrested, on average, 50 violent criminals every single day. Or our continued focus on human trafficking, where this August, through our annual Operation Cross Country, for instance, the FBI and our partners located more than 200 victims of human trafficking, many of them little kids. Or the work of our transnational organized crime section, that it's doing in partnership with agencies like DHS to investigate the movement of people, drugs, guns, and money into the United States across our southern border. The breadth and depth of the threats that the FBI's dedicated men and women are tackling each and every day is staggering. And I continue to be inspired by their commitment to our mission of protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution, and I know we will continue to answer the call. So thank you again for having me here again today, and I'd be happy to address your questions. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, Chair now recognizes Director Avizé to summarize her statement for five minutes. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the overall terrorism landscape. Now, despite significant progress in diminishing the terrorist threat to the United States, the country continues to face a diversified, transnational, and
and in many ways unpredictable threat environment, both at home and abroad. An array of actors, whether foreign terrorist organizations, state sponsors of terrorism, or lone actors are shaping the nature of today's threat. This changed environment exists amid an ongoing transition for the counterterrorism community where CT, while critical, is one of many competing priorities that the US national security community must be postured to address. In today's testimony, I'll start by giving an overview of the terrorist threat to the homeland, I'll turn to the overseas threat, and then end with some comments on the importance of our continued CT focus. Regarding the threat to the United States homeland, terrorist organizations such as ISIS and Al Qaeda remain committed to attacking the United States. However, unlike 21 years ago, the threat today is more likely to take the form of an individual attacker inspired by these groups rather than a highly networked, hierarchically directed terrorist plot. In fact, since 9-11, 37 of the 45 ISIS or Al-Qaeda linked attacks in the homeland have been inspired by these groups rather than centrally managed by them. This trend toward lone actor threats inside the United States extends beyond ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It also characterizes the threat we face from domestic actors, such as racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, militia violent extremists, or anarchist violent extremists. In particular, the US-based racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists, or REM-V threat, has the most obvious links to transnational actors whose plots and professed ideology encourage mobilization to violence by those vulnerable to their messaging. This threat is fluid, it's fragmented, it lacks in hierarchical structures, and it has proponents around the globe and in the US framing actions around the concept of leaderless resistance. Transitioning to the overseas environment, Sunni and Shia-driven terrorist movements worldwide continue to dominate the threat to Americans. ISIS and Al-Qaeda continue to aspire to attack the US and other Western targets overseas, though they have been more effective at pursuing operations against regional and local adversaries. For its part, ISIS in Iraq and Syria remains an intact, centrally-led organization that will most likely continue to pose both a global threat and a local one, despite the death of its emir in February, Haji Abdullah. While significantly weaker than at its peak in 2015 and through 2017, ISIS leaders from Iraq and Syria have been successful at spurning branches and networks across Africa and as far as South and East Asia with its two most effective branches currently operating out of West Africa and Afghanistan. Likewise, Al-Qaeda maintains its regional affiliate structure, positioned effectively in parts of North and East Africa, the Middle East, and to a lesser extent, South Asia. The July death of longtime Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri was a strategic and symbolic setback for Al-Qaeda, but it does not put an end to the organization. In particular, in the Middle East, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is a destabilizing actor in Yemen and remains among the most intrepid Al-Qaeda affiliates intent on attacking the United States homeland. Two other prominent Al-Qaeda affiliates also stand out, both for their growing regional influence and their significant capabilities. The Sahel-based Al-Qaeda affiliate JNIM and the Somalia-based affiliate Al-Shabaab. Transitioning from Sunni terrorism to threats emanating from Iran, its partners and proxies, Iran continues to plan, encourage, and support plots against the United States, both at home and in the Middle East where we have a significant US military presence. Iran and its proxy Lebanese Hezbollah have sought to plot attacks against former US officials to retaliate for the death of Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps Codes Force Commander Qasem Soleimani raising the threat both at home and abroad for those that Iran deems responsible. In closing, I'd just highlight that the complexity of the terrorism environment that I just outlined continues to demand a collaborative, agile, and sufficiently resourced CT effort to mitigate terrorist threats to the United States. It is clear that the significant CT pressure brought to bear against terrorist groups over the last two decades along with investment in effective CT defenses here at home, has resulted in a diminished threat to the United States homeland. NCTC and its CT partners across the government are working towards a sustainable and enduring level of support to this mission that maintains that strategic success, 
even as other national security priorities drive our national strategy. Finally, I want to assure this committee that the interagency enterprise of CT practitioners remains committed to this mission and are working behind the scenes every day to protect the American people, both at home and abroad. I thank them for their service and their dedication to this country. With that, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. I thank the witnesses for their testimony. I remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the witnesses. I will now recognize myself for questions. Secretary Mayorkas, last year you said that, quote, domestic violent extremism poses the most lethal and persistent terrorism-related threat to our country today. Is that still true? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that continues uh, to be uh, our assessment in the Department of Homeland Security, that domestic violent extremism, uh, particularly through um, lone actors or small uh, groups uh, loosely affiliated, um, are spurred to violence uh, by uh, ideologies of hate, uh, anti-government sentiments, personal grievances, and other narratives uh, propagated on online platforms. Uh, Director Ray, <clears throat> what, um, what results on this uh, domestic terrorism uh, threat are you seeing uh, from the lens of the FBI? Well, certainly we have seen over the last several years, really going back to uh, maybe the summer of 2019, uh, an increase in domestic violent extremism. And we are concerned about uh, the lethality, especially of racially motivated violent extremists, and then the spike that started in 2020 of anti-government, anti-authority violent extremism. And so we have very active investigations really all over the country through our joint terrorism task forces in all 56 field offices. Um, and it is a, a growing problem. You know, this committee is well aware of the whole phenomenon of connecting the dots uh, and the importance of that. It's the very reason why agencies like NCTC and DHS uh, exist in many ways. But with the lone actors in these small cells, the real problem there is there are not a lot of dots out there to connect. And there's very little time in which to connect them. So that presents a whole new type of challenge for, for law enforcement and the intelligence community and puts a premium on our engagement with the public uh, with our state and local law enforcement partners in particular who really become the eyes and ears that are so critical because any one of them could have the one dot that we need. Uh, Ms. Abizade, uh, you talked about uh, the pressure that um, we have applied to our international terrorist community and the results that have uh, benefited from that pressure. Uh, is it something that uh, we need to increase the investment in that or increase the relationships with other governments? How do you see that going forward? I think a sustained investment in our international counterterrorism enterprise is very important to be able to sustain the pressure against international groups uh, going forward. Um, I agree with my colleagues' assessments here about the relative threat from domestic violent extremist actors here in the homeland versus international actors. Those international actors are continuing to plot, and if they had an opportunity to infiltrate the United States, they would certainly look to exploit it. Uh, it's our international partnerships, our array of law enforcement, intelligence, relationships and capabilities that enable us to stay on top of this international threat, even as we're dealing with some of those dynamics that Director Ray talked about here in the homeland that make it difficult for us to deal with a lone actor threat. Uh, Director Ray, uh, about a third of the historically black colleges in this country uh, over the last year have received bomb threats. Can you uh, enlighten us on the FBI's uh, attempt to uh, mitigate or capture those individuals responsible uh, for those threats? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Needless to say, we take these threats very seriously. Uh, and frankly, the idea of, of causing the fear and disruption that they have caused is just really outrageous. 
and unacceptable. Uh, we have joint terrorism task forces working on it, 30 field offices, multiple headquarters divisions. Uh, it's very much ongoing. I think what I could say uh, for purposes of today is that we've recently, with respect to the first big tranche of the threats, um, investigation has identified a, a, an underage, a juvenile subject, um, and because of the federal limitations on charging juveniles with federal crimes, we have worked with uh, state prosecutors to uh, ensure that that individual is charged under various other state offenses, which will ensure some level of restrictions and monitoring and disruption of his criminal behavior. Since that big tranche that, that we believe that individual was responsible for, there have been two other tranches, and we're very actively investigating those, but there's not much I can say on, on those ongoing active investigations, those other investigations at this time. But we've been very engaged with HBCUs all over the country. We've done sort of national conference calls and so forth with them to try to update them wherever we can. We recognize the, the fear um, and anger that this quite rightly causes uh, in those communities, and we're determined to, uh, to see this through. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you all for uh, your testimony today. And that as you were speaking, it just occurred to me how important this committee is and how important each of your respective work is. And it's our job to do oversight, and sometimes it's unpleasant. But the bottom line is we must never forget that you're at the head of keeping this country safe. And I appreciate all the efforts of all of you. Sometimes you stumble like we all do, but it's also time to, to say thank you for what you do and, and, and how you do it. And you know, when you hear about all the threats, it's hard to really distinguish one as the ubiquitous threat. But it seems to me that one of the most pervasive threats that exists now that didn't even re wasn't really on our radar eight years ago when I came in to Congress was a cyber issue. And uh, what we've done with respect to cyber with this committee is commendable, especially working with Chairman Thompson, standing up CISA as an agency and making them at the, like I like to call the quarterback on the, on the domestic front. And how well you work with the other agencies like the FBI uh, in that, that realm is, is great. But when you have cyber attacks like on a water plant in Florida, which if successful would have killed thousands of people, you realize what a pervasive, and probably the most ubiquitous threat we have in the United States is cyber. So in that realm, um, I, I'm very heartened to see how CISA uh, has stepped up working in conjunction with the private sector as a partnership. It's not a, it's not a more of a, it's not a regulatory type setting. It's more of a exchange of information and how well you work with uh, the other agencies, including the FBI as well. So that's great. So. Uh, Chairman Mayorkas, I just want to ask you, what's your vision for CISA going forward, given the current threat environment and how important it is that we make sure CISA is strong and, and, uh, and grows? Uh, Ranking Member Ketko, let me um, uh, just uh, thank you for your uh, uh, co-leadership of, of this <coughs> committee and, and your service. I also uh, want to express my thanks to this entire committee for its support of our cybersecurity mission, not only in the creation of the of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, but also in the uh, new legislation, the cyber incident uh, reporting requirements, which I think are going to really strengthen uh, the cyber uh, security of this entire uh, nation. Uh, I think, um, Ranking Member Katko, you set forth a very uh, important blueprint uh, for CISA and Cybersecurity 2025. And what we need to do is to strengthen, only strengthen the public-private partnership that really defines the cybersecurity ecosystem. The Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative uh, that CISA has launched is really a tremendous success. And it's not just domestic, uh, but our JCDC, as it is known by its acronym, and our international relationships and the partnerships are going to be increasingly vital uh, as a nation, uh, you know, adverse nation states only seek uh, to perpetuate uh, harm uh, through uh, the virtual world. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was in Singapore uh, for one of the world's uh, preeminent um, cyber conferences, and I spoke very starkly about the, the threat that China poses uh, in the cybersecurity arena uh, and how dangerous and perilous it is for countries to allow China uh, to actually uh, create their cyber infrastructure 
and how we need to combat that and create a level playing field. A, a competition of fairness is, of course, how we define ourselves, uh, but uh, to deal with a country that violates norms and does not act responsibility, responsibly is something that we have to address. And so the public-private partnership, the international relationships, the sharing of information is so vital, and that is really where we are headed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and Directors Ray and Abazid. Um, every day you wake up probably thinking the same thing I do, and I look at my phone and see if there's an attack that, that, that evening or somewhere around the world, and oftentimes, sadly, there has been. So the, the, the threat of terrorist groups, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all the others, is still very real, and I know you spend a lot of time with that. And I just wish you could comment real quick and tell me if that threat matrix has changed since uh, we, we left Afghanistan. Is Afghanistan becoming a breeding ground again? Is it more of a concern again? And I'll start with Ms. Abazid, please, briefly. Yeah, I would say that um, from Afghanistan, the threat that I'm most concerned about is actually from the ISIS affiliate, the ISIS Khorasan affiliate. That's a group that um, has demonstrated uh, a very significant capability against the Taliban in Afghanistan right now. They have conducted some attacks outside of Afghanistan in the immediate environs, and I am worried about their ambition for greater uh, and wider spread attacks. And so it's a top priority for us. Director Ray. I would share Director Abizade's concern about ISIS-K in the, in the immediate term. Uh, I would just add that we are very concerned about Al-Qaeda, the prospect of Al-Qaeda reconstituting given the relationship with the Taliban, and that is the, um, the flip side of finding Zawahri right in the middle of Kabul. Um, <laughs> exactly. And then I would add to that, uh, we are concerned about the possibility that either Al-Qaeda or ISIS-K could inspire um, attacks here in the U.S. Uh, or against Americans elsewhere. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. The chair will now recognize other members for questions they may wish to ask witnesses. The chair will recognize members in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority. Members are participating virtually are reminded to unmute themselves when recognized for questioning, and then to mute themselves once they've finished speaking and to leave their cameras on so they are visible to the chair. The chair recognizes for five minutes the gentlelady lady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne, for five minutes. I want to thank everybody for their testimony today. Um, please uh, bear with me a minute. I lost my. Gentlemen, we must change. We hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, an armed man broke into uh, the San Francisco home of Speaker Pelosi in what appeared to be an assassination attempt. Uh, although Speaker Pelosi was not home, the intruder violently attacked uh, the Speaker's 82-year-old husband, putting him in the hospital. This attack, this attack occurred at a tense time for our nation, uh, with extreme rhetoric suggesting violence against public officials. Director Ray, um, your own agency uh, has also been subjected to uh, such attacks after uh, executing a uh, search pers pursuant to a lawful warrant on the former president's residence, as uh, we saw with the um, incident outside an FBI office in Ohio. Uh, to the panel, how do you um, assess the current threats against elected and government officials, and how do you, uh, how do your agency uh, proactively protect against this violence? Well, I'll I'll start off and see whether uh, Secretary Mayorkas may want to to chime in. 
Uh, the, the phenomenon that you're describing, Congressman, uh, I think has two pieces of it. Um, the first is related towards violence towards all sorts of individuals in government uh, kind of across the spectrum, and the second is law enforcement specific. On the first, uh, we have seen a, a trend over the last several years uh, of people more and more in this country when they're upset or angry about something, uh, turning to violence as the way to manifest it. And uh, that is a very, very dangerous trend. Uh, there is a right way under the First Amendment to express how angry and upset you are about something or with somebody, but violence and violence against government officials uh, is not it. But that is something that we've been seeing across the political spectrum now for quite a number of years. Second, I mentioned law enforcement. It is a reality that an already dangerous profession, namely law enforcement, has become more dangerous. Last year was the highest number of law enforcement officers shot and killed in the line of duty since 9-11. Uh, and I know personally because we've had agents shot and killed. We had a task force officer uh, shot and killed ambushed right outside one of our small offices in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, and I call, one of the things I did when I started in this job was that I said I was gonna call Every time an officer is shot and killed anywhere in the country in the line of duty, I was going to call the chief or the sheriff myself and express my condolences. And I've made way north of 200 of those calls. It, often it's one a week. Uh, and each one of those officers killed leaves behind a family, a department, and a community uh, that'll never be the same. And so the phenomenon that you described affects both government officials as victims across the spectrum, but also law enforcement uniquely, uh, and it's a, a trend that we should all as Americans be concerned about. Secretary Mayorkas. Let me echo um, uh, what uh, the director said about um, what a tragically difficult year it has been for law enforcement. I want to um, reference one additional statistic, which is uh, this year has seen the greatest number of ambushes against law enforcement officers. And uh, there is uh, no more noble uh, profession than the law enforcement uh, profession. And I know a number of you on this committee have served uh, in that capacity. One of the areas of emphasis uh, that the director and I have had is to uh, be sure to disseminate timely and actionable information to state, local, tribal, territorial, and campus law enforcement so that we equip our local communities to understand uh, the threat landscape before them and prevent violent acts uh, from occurring in the first instance. Thank you. Um, that was a quick five minutes, and I will yield back. Gentlemen's <laughs> time <clears throat> has expired. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas for five minutes, Mr. McCall. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all three of you uh, for your service. As Mr. Katko mentioned, I know it's not an easy job. Um, and I chaired this committee, you know, back in the day. And uh, um, I, I want to, you know, as, in my position being a leader now in foreign affairs, um, with the collapse of Afghanistan, what I've seen is a rise in our foreign nation adversary states and the threat quite honestly, and the way it was done with the Taliban in charge of the evacuation, in charge of H. Kaya, a suicide bomber coming in and killing 13 <coughs> servicemen and women, uh, leaving Americans behind, leaving Afghan partners behind, getting Afghans on the planes that shouldn't have been on the airplanes that got into the United States because it was so chaotic. Now that doesn't really fall into either of y'all's jurisdiction, perhaps, Perhaps uh, Secretary Mayorkas to the extent of the screening uh, coming in from the planes. But then we saw Putin invade Ukraine. And now we see a rise in China, communist China threatening Taiwan. We see a, an Ayatollah close to a nuclear bomb. And Kim Jong-un is firing rockets off again, now over Japan. I argue that the world's getting more dangerous and I know that you're more domestic, but you have to look at the world and the threats. And it's a worldwide threat hearing to determine 
can those threats get into the homeland? That's always been the question, whether it be through ports and airports, which is the more typical way they do this, or what worries me now is, is the situation at the border. The fact that it is wide open and the combination of the Taliban taking over, uh, Mr. Rikani, uh, a wanted terrorist, being their Minister of Interior, now Minister really of Security is what he is, harboring Al Zawahiri, who is Bin Laden's top lieutenant in his own house. And I applaud the administration for targeting him and taking him out, but we don't have eyes and ears anymore. We've lost access to Bagram, and now China's in there with the lithium, and we'll probably get access to Bagram, that being the end result. My question is, maybe to the director of the FBI, what is your concern about the threat combination of this unmanaged wide open border situation and the threat from Al Qaeda and ISIS coming out of Afghanistan, not to mention the fentanyls and all the other bad stuff. And then lastly, the terror watch list, as I understand there are 98 of them. Uh, when I was chair of this committee, we would get briefed on those individuals, not just the numbers. It's my understanding this committee's not getting the full briefing on who are these people that have attempted to get into the United States, much less the ones that already uh, have. Uh, Director Ray. Uh, well, Congressman, you raise a number of, uh, I think, very legitimate and important issues. Uh, when it comes to the border in particular, uh, it is a, a very significant uh, and important challenge. There's a, a whole wide array of criminal threats uh, that come in terms of drugs, money, guns, violence, um, and you mentioned some of that uh, in your comments. There's also, of course, a concern from a national security perspective, any Port of entry uh, is a, a possible vector that uh, uh, a terrorist organization could choose to exploit. Now, historically, historically, foreign terrorist organizations have not chosen illegal immigration as the way to seed operatives, as they've usually preferred to either recruit somebody here or send somebody in legally just because of the risks. Right. Uh, but we have seen, uh, you know, over the last five years, an increase in the number of, of KSTs uh, who've been encountered, who've attempted to cross. And so that is obviously something we remain very concerned about. Uh, and you may have seen uh, last uh, early summer, uh, we announced the indictment of an individual who was trying to bring uh, foreign nationals in, to, in a plot to kill former President Bush. Uh, and, and thanks for bringing that up. That was one other thing. I, my, my time's getting ready to expire, but I guess the point for this uh, committee to really evaluate the threat to respond on a policy basis, uh, I, we don't know who these 98 people are, where they're from. We, we don't really have any identifying information to know who they are, where they're coming from, how they, what, what was their motivation to get into the United States. And so I would ask it that maybe, Mr. Chairman, that we, I think this committee, as we, when you and I, when I was chair and your ranking member, we, we got that information. Yes, uh, and we will proceed to get it this time. Thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. Uh, and uh, uh, thank the chairman for his kind words and his opening remarks on my uh, uh, leaving the committee at the, uh, the end of this year. It's been a pleasure serving with everyone, and I uh, uh, will miss the work and the people deeply. But I uh, thank our witnesses for being here. Um, uh, so it's been one year since the department submitted uh, its report evaluating PPD 21 uh, as required by Section 9002 of the 2021 NDAA. Uh, in a letter last week concurring with that review, President Biden acknowledged that the U.S., uh, and I quote, lacks a comprehensive way to establish mandatory minimum cybersecurity requirements across our critical infrastructure, uh, and current approaches differ by sector, end quote. Uh, he also uh, committed to uh, working with Congress to fill gaps in, in statutory uh, authorities. So to all of our witnesses, um, 
what gap should we be looking to fill related to improving uh, the cybersecurity of, of critical infrastructure? And, uh, and then Secretary Mayorkas in particular, uh, the, the letter mentions a, a focused effort to help sector risk management agencies identify systemically important critical uh, uh, entities uh, in their sector. How is DHS approaching this task? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman. I, I, I believe I, I, I caught the, the gist of your question. We, we are uh, doing a, quite a number of things to address uh, cybersecurity and specifically in the critical infrastructure arena. Of course, the, uh, the mandatory cyber uh, incident reporting um, legislation uh, that you and um, uh, other members of this committee championed is, is going to be so so vitally uh, important and, quite frankly, a model for other countries uh, to follow. Um, TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, uh, for the first time used its regulatory authority following the colonial pipeline attack to promulgate security directives uh, to really require um, uh, stakeholders uh, in that sector uh, to uh, employ some of the more basic uh, cyber hygiene mechanisms. Just in the last few weeks, uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, promulgated its voluntary cyber uh, security performance goals, which really make cyber hygiene far more understandable and accessible to a broad spectrum of industry uh, leaders and industry participants, where we recommend uh, particular measures. We identify the cost uh, of each me measure, the prioritization of each me measure, the complexity of implementation, uh, and the benefits uh, to be gained. One of the areas, as I mentioned, in response to Ranking Member Katko's uh, question, one of the areas where we are also pressing very, very hard, and this touches upon Congressman McCall's point, is the need for international collaboration not only because of the increasingly global footprint uh, of, of companies, but because of the fact that we are dealing more and more with adverse nation states and their potential impact on the homeland. All right, thank you, Secretary. Um, let me go to another uh, area. Uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was in some ways galvanized, uh, uh, it, it, uh, galvanized collaboration among CISA, FBI, and other federal agencies to respond uh, to the, the heightened uh, cyber threats environment. In this case, they quickly parted, uh, uh, partnered with uh, security firms and critical infrastructure stakeholders to help prepare for potential retaliatory Russian uh, attacks. Director Ray, how would you characterize the ongoing threat of retaliatory Russian cyber attacks to U.S. critical infrastructure as the landscape uh, the war in Ukraine continues to change? And Secretary Mayorkas, uh, how can we build on lessons learned earlier this year through efforts like Shields Up or the, uh, the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative to make critical infrastructure owners and operators continue uh, to stay engaged and vigilant? Well, when it comes to critical infrastructure, I, I think I would say that there's become an increasingly crowded field of threat actors targeting critical infrastructure, uh, whether it's ransomware or that some other kind of uh, malicious cyber activity. Uh, and one of the things we're particularly concerned about uh, during the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the possibility that, um, for example, the Russian intelligence services, which have long targeted our critical infrastructure for espionage purposes, could choose to use the same access uh, for more destructive purposes. And it's put a premium on the kind of private sector partnership uh, that I know CISA, as, as well as the FBI, have engaged in very strongly. Uh, the private sector partnership is the critical ingredient to defending critical infrastructure in this country, and I think we've made a very significant progress. There's also a lot more work to be done, but we are very much on the right path, in my view. Gentlemen, Time has expired. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a major threat to our homeland is clearly the arterial bleed at our southern border and the disintegration of our sovereignty down there, and a top threat to individual rights and freedoms for Americans from sea to shining sea, Mr. Ray 
is the weaponization of the FBI against the American citizens that you sworn to serve. Secretary Mayorkas, for the record, are you aware or have you authorized CBP agents to release illegal aliens into America without identifying, screening, or vetting them properly, or harvesting even basic biometric data like fingerprints? Uh, Congressman, um, our nation's so uh, sovereignty stands strong, and our brave men and women in in the Border Patrol and throughout U.S. Customs. Are you aware, have you authorized CBP uh, agents early. to release illegal aliens into America without having properly vetted to identify them or collected at least basic biometric data like fingerprints? Congressman. I mean, uh, you got millions coming across. Uh, Congressman, uh, our. Gentlemen from, uh, uh, Ms. Higgins, allow the Secretary to It's answer. my time, Mr. Chairman. It, if I want to well, reclaim my time, I will. Uh, well. Uh, yeah, I'm going to move on without an answer. Mr. Chairman, are Mr. you asking to be, for me to yield your time? No, you, you, I'm the chair. Then I'm going to reclaim my no, time. You, look, we don't. Moving on, no, Secretary no, Mayorkas. The gentleman from. Are you interrupting my time, Mr. Chairman? Uh, or are you well, requesting me I'm to trying, yield your time? I'm trying to make sure that we conduct. You're uh, interfering with my five minutes, Mr. Chairman. Well, then the gentleman will. If you request you. me to yield your time, I'll give you time. No, but that's not the procedure. But that is the procedure. It, it is not. It yes, is not. it is. So, of course, look, it is. Look, I, I reclaim my time, and I, I want this time back. Secretary Mayorkas, uh, look, have you used uh, your authority uh, to suppress exculpatory evidence presented by CBP agents who've come under public attack and condemnation by DHS and the Biden administration? Have you used your authority to suppress exculpatory evidence? presented by CBP agents who've come under public attack and condemnation by you and the Biden administration. Two points, if I may, Congressman. Number one, in response to your second question, I don't even know what you're referring to. And with, with respect to your first I'll question. I'll take that as that you're on the record as saying no. U.S. That you customs. have not used your authority to suppress exculpatory evidence. If you're, if you're an honorable man, then obviously you should be able to say no to that. Who would suppress exculpatory evidence? Is your answer no? I don't even know what you're referring to, Congressman. You will. And, and if I may, in Secretary response, Mayorkas, respect. have you used your authority to retaliate against DHS agents who served on special details during the Trump administration, agents identified by your administration as conservatives or Trump supporters? Once again, Congressman. I don't even know what you're referring to. You're before Congress. I'm going to take that as a no. Through your authority, Secretary Mayorkas, have you encouraged your chain of command to suppress basic law enforcement actions at the border and harass or victimize or intimidate experienced frontline law enforcement agents at the border using internal investigations and threats of disciplinary action or transfer in order to force those agents to comply with DHS policies that actually injure the security of our homeland and are contrary to the sworn oath of those agents. Is that the culture you've created? Congressman, I don't even know what you're referring to. You will. Uh, and I am. Uh, Secretary and Mayorkas, final question, good sir. Of honor and it's been rumored and nobility throughout the Department of Homeland Security. That is you represent. What is that Nobility, is Secretary Mayorkas. Congressman, that is what I am dedicated to. It's been rumored, Secretary, that you're going to resign prior to January the 3rd. Is any truth to those rumors? That is a false rumor. All right. We look forward to seeing you in January. Um, Director Ray, does, it, does the FBI have confidential human sources? Uh, did the FBI have confidential human sources embedded within the January 6th protesters on January 6th of 2021? Well, Congressman, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I have to be very careful about what I can say about when Even we now, because that's what you I, told us two I years ago. May I finish? Uh, about when we do and do not, and where we have and have not used confidential human sources. Uh, but to the extent that there's a suggestion, for example, that the FBI's confidential human sources or FBI employees in some way instigated or orchestrated January 6th, that's categorically false. Did you have confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters inside the Capitol on January the 6th 
prior to the doors being open? Again, I had to be very careful. It should be a no. Say. Can you not tell the American people no? We did not have confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters positioned inside the Capitol. Gentlemen's time has expired. You should not read anything into my decision uh, not to share information. Director Ray, confidential human gentlemen's sources. time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. All of our witnesses are here today as guests of the committee to discuss threats to the homeland. As our guests, we owe our witnesses respect. And the subject matter of today's hearing deserves thoughtfulness. The chair encourages all members to be polite and to take today's worldwide threats hearing seriously. Chair Mr. Chairman, may I add from, I just add briefly. Yes. Just so I understand my, my colleagues on my side of the aisle. If the chairman speaks, he has, he has the authority to speak at any time he wants. If he speaks, we will make sure you get your time back. So going forward, just understand that, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our honored guests today for this most important discussion. Mr. Ray, Ms. Mayorkas, Ms. Asbida, thank you for being here. Secretary Mayorkas, uh, talking about counterterrorism, threats to the homeland, really threats to Americans on a worldwide basis. We need strong allies around the world to protect the homeland. When Secretary Kelly was there in your position a number of years ago, I asked him about border security. We acknowledge, we agree that border security does not begin and end at the border. If a threat gets to the border, we've got a problem. So my question to you is, do you feel like we have enough or do we need additional resources to be able to coordinate intel for the benefit of security of all Americans around the globe? Congressman, um, we are working um, more closely than ever before with our partners. So if I'm interrupt you, next week is World Cup. Cutter, thousands of Americans will be there. And I presume my question is to you and of course, uh, Mr. Ray, are we coordinating enough with the government and Cutter to make sure Americans will be safe there? Uh, we certainly, Congressman, have been working uh, with the Qataris uh, in advising them with respect to how to enhance security to Director Ray. protect Americans uh, there. Uh, we, I would just agree with Secretary Mayorkas that we've been providing significant assistance and support to the Qataris uh, in their efforts to secure the World Cup. You would disagree we have? No, I said I would agree with Secretary Mayorkas. You would agree, thank you. So I guess the next step is lessons learned. In four years, we will have the World Cup in the United States. So any breach, I mean, the government of Qatar, we hope, we'll have 100% in terms of defense there, no lapses. And I'm hoping we're there to learn their lessons because we're gonna to have to apply those in the United States in four years. Are we shadowing what they're doing? That's, a, that's an important part of, of why we're providing the assistance and the support. It's not just because it's the right thing to do to help the Qataris and the- and It's the right thing for American it's citizens also the right around thing the for world America because to make sure we protect Yes. Ms. Abizad, any thoughts on how we can enhance the security of Americans around the globe? So just on, on the, the World Cup point, I would say, you know, the Qataris are very good partners. It's a partnership that we are engaged in um, from an intelligence community side. We have a threat integration cell that is stationed there as we do for all major events. And the Qataris actually learned from us before we're gonna be able to learn from them when they came out during the Super Bowl in, uh, in LA to understand how we in the United States do security for major events like this. So it's an ongoing conversation, ongoing partnership. And I would just say from an international perspective, those partnerships that you mentioned are absolutely critical to being able to secure the country here. Mr. Mayorkas. I concur with that, and I should say, Congressman, that we have a very, very well exercised and trained methodology to address um, major events. 
uh, and that is throughout the interagency in the federal government, and we work very closely with state and local partners. This is a, a very um, evolved architecture that we have built that others learn from, and we, of course, uh, are in an ongoing learning process. In my last 67 seconds, I would ask all of you, really, that uh, uh, an ask of you, which is, uh, what else can we do as a committee to make sure that we're coordinating with our allies and friends around, and maybe even our unfriends around the world, to make sure we, we stop catastrophic events like 911? You know, we talk about border security and 911. The terrorists that perpetrated 911 entered this country legally, and we continue to focus on the border, on refugees, when the bigger issue is working with our allies around the world and other unfriends to make sure we stop those threats from happening again. What do you need from us to make sure that that type of coordination exists and can, is enhanced moving forward? Well, uh, one thing, obviously, it would be a long list and we welcome the discussion, but the, the top thing on my list would be to urge Congress to reauthorize Section 702 when it comes up for renewal at the end of next year, because that is the critical tool to understanding foreign threats, uh, which may have, again, foreign threats that may have an impact on the U.S. So, Mayorkas, my six seconds left. Uh, we have one uh, imminent um, reauthorization that is uh, very much needed, and that is our countering unmanned aerial systems authority. And I think that our budget um, is something that is very, very important to pass to provide us with the resources to advance our international partnerships. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi for five minutes, Mr. Guest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, as we're here today speaking on threats to the homeland, uh, these threats are magnified by our unsecured border. Um, a few moments ago, uh, Director Ray, in response to a question by uh, Mr. McCall, stated the border is a challenge. Uh, he referred to drugs, money laundering, guns, and violence. Uh, you referenced some of the same information in your report. On page 13, you say that transnational criminal organizations continue to pose a threat to the United States. You speak of drug-related crime, money laundering, human smuggling. Uh, then on page 15, uh, in further detail as it relates to human smuggling, uh, you say at our southwest border we are experiencing historic levels of encounters. Uh, and we know that those are numbers that you referred to are borne out by the statistics uh, that your agency puts out each and every month. Now, for the eighth straight month, we have had more than 200,000 encounters along our southwest border. Physical year 2022, those numbers were more than 200, excuse me, more than 2,378,000. Physical year 2021, 1,734,000. Compare those numbers to the last year of the prior administration, physical year 2020, uh, those numbers were 458,000. So we see that during a two-year period, the number of encounters along our southwest border has increased over 520 percent. Just taking 2022 and 2021 combined, those two years in which you have been in charge of this agency, uh, we see a number that exceeds 4 million. Uh, to put that number in perspective, uh, that is a number larger than 23 of the states that compile the, or comprise the United States of America. And so looking at that, you have previously stated uh, that the border is closed, uh, the border is secure, uh, and that we have not lost operational control of the border. Uh, I ask you once again today, do you still stand by your statement based on those statistical figures that the border is closed, the border is secure, and that we have not lost operational control. Uh, Congressman uh, Guest, uh, let me share a few thoughts because I think it's very important uh, to put the challenge uh, at our southern border, and it's a very serious challenge in a proper context. It is a challenge that is not specific or exclusive to our southern border. 
This is a challenge that exists throughout the hemisphere. And let me give a very powerful and, and Mr. Because I'm not trying to interrupt you. I have very limited time. And so I'd like to focus my question on the southwest border. If we'd like to meet outside this committee meeting when we have additional time, you and I have met before and would be happy to meet with you again. Uh, but since I'm now down to two minutes, I want to focus my questioning specifically on the southwest border. You have said when you have appeared before this committee that you need additional time, your agency needs additional time to get this crisis under control. And we see, as Congress, we see no evidence that the situation along the southwest border is getting better. A matter of fact, looking statistically, it seems like the border is getting worse. And we can say that the, these number of immigrants, we know that of these number of immigrants that we see here uh, that have, have come across our border, we have statistics here that 98 percent of those, or excuse me, 98 people on that list uh, are on, are of those individuals were on the terrorist watch list. And so we as a committee, we as a Congress, we as the American public, we want to have faith that you and your agency are seeking to get this challenge under control. But I'm looking at statistics, and statistics tell me that that is not the case. Statistics tell me that the border is only getting worse, and that since this administration has taken control, that the policies that you have put in place have failed and that they have failed miserably. We know that Commissioner Mangus recently was forced to resign from office, and I applaud you for removing him. I thought he did a terrible job, and I hope that there are other people that you will remove and that you will work with a Republican-controlled Congress to find a way to secure the border. Uh, and so what I'm hoping and what I'm asking here, and I will give you the last uh, 30 seconds of my time, is what will you do as... Your current, in your current position to help us secure the border, because that's what we all want. Republicans, Democrats, we want a secure border. We clearly do not have that now, and what will you help us do to make sure we get back to the levels that we saw in physical year 2020? Congressman Guest, I very much look forward to working with you and this entire uh, committee to enhance uh, the security of our border. Let me give two examples of things that we are doing and two things that I think Congress can do. Uh, number one, we are taking it to the smugglers and the transnational criminal organizations at an unprecedented level. We have a disruption campaign, uh, interagency disruption campaign that has led to more than 6,000 arrests, working not only in the interagency, but with our international partners. We are taking it to them at an unprecedented level, number one. Number two, if one takes a look at the program that we recently implemented with respect to Venezuelan nationals, which were the highest number of encounters that we were experiencing. The demographics at our southern border have changed dramatically over the last several years. If one takes a look at that program at its early phase, we were experiencing 11, approximately 1,100 encounters of Venezuelan nationals a day. And since the implementation of the program, that is now approximately 300 uh, per day. That is an example of the things that we are doing to enhance the security of our border. Two things that Congress can do. Number one is pass our budget, which provides for additional resources to the Department of Homeland Security and others to enhance our border security, including for the first time since 2011, 300 more Border Patrol agents. And number two, once and for all, pass immigration reform including, for example, much-needed reform to our asylum system. Everyone agrees the system is broken and we need it fixed. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes John Lady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Chair recognizes John Lady from uh, Michigan, this like a state in the union, Michigan. Um, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, and I just he, he's departed the 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 room, but I just wanted to appreciate um, John Katko, uh, my friend who is departing this committee, and the tone he has set in this committee. And it is my fervent hope um, that as the other side of the aisle seems poised to take over, that we keep this focused on homeland threats and not making this a place of political theater. That is my desperate hope, and I think that is the message that was sent by the voters last week. I hope they hear it and continue in that spirit. Um, secondly, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, 
the threats that you've all talked about today, um, whether it's um, domestic terrorism and homegrown threats, the threats coming through our border, cybersecurity, and the threats of ransomware, um, information and disinformation coming from uh, you know, places like Russia and China. Um, what has really struck me is how the threats that are most prominent for Americans today are really affecting civilians. They're not going after um, law enforcement agents. They're not going after our military. They're going after civilians in our K through 12 schools, in our hospitals, through our water treatment plants. Um, the threats are much more personal and they're much more sort of for the average American. Um, and they desperately want to know what we are doing to protect them. Um, now, I was in the CIA and the Pentagon for many, many years, and we are all um, uh, have to be careful not to fight the previous war and to make sure that we're adapting to today's threats, particularly on cyber. I'm worried that we've had, um, you know, as we remember in 9-11, we had the attacks in Kenya, we had the attacks on the USS Cole, and then we had 9-11. And I feel like on our cyber attacks, we have had our USS Cole. We've had the Colonial Pipeline. We've had our meat processing facility. Um, we've had uh, solar winds. Um, so we all thought about what would we have done if we could have imagined the threat of 9-11? Um, what would we have done to better prepare? So Secretary Mayorkas, please tell me the two or three things that you wish you could do. Either you need the resources or you need the attention of the American people to prevent a cyber 9-11. Uh, Congresswoman, um, uh, my opening, in my opening remarks, I, I talked about uh, the threat landscape and how, in fact, uh, the goal of our adversaries is, in, is, is indeed to disrupt our, our way of life, and I think you captured that very well in your um, opening remarks. We have done uh, a great deal uh, to enhance the um, security of the cyber ecosystem, and when I say we, it's not just the department, but, of course, working very closely with our partners. And that is, um, number one, to equip the private sector with information and to educate them on the tools to advance cyber hygiene. And we've done that for the civilian population as well. If we take a look at some of the very accessible uh, sites that we have created on the web, stopransomware.gov, cisa.gov, some of the very simple measures that people can take, uh, whether it's multi-factor authentication, backing up one systems, using safe and secure uh, passwords. These are the things that we need to do and continue to do. And the more that we can amplify collectively, uh, we in the government, in Congress, the imperative of maintaining cyber hygiene, raising the alertness of the average citizen to the imperative, especially in an increasingly interconnected world, I think that is uh, one yeah. critical goal. I, I would offer, um, it would be useful if we had a list of specific things, your asks, right? We all want to prevent these cyber attacks. I think cyber issues are very bipartisan in this Congress and have been and hopefully will be in the future Congress. So please be um, uh, assertive with what you need in order to protect the American people because they feel like they don't know what what is defending them. Um, uh, secondly, uh, uh, Director Ray, I was heartened um, to hear your story of calling all the families of fallen law enforcement that have been killed over the past uh, year or time in your, in, that you've been in service. Um, I am very worried, just coming out of campaign season, the number of people who think that the FBI um, is a political tool, as we heard even raised in questions here today. Um, can you please talk to the American people about the FBI and explain in your words um, why they should trust their federal law enforcement? So there are a lot of opinions out there about the FBI, just like there are about everything. But my opinion, the window that I get to see into our workforce is unique. And I have visited all 56 of our field offices at least twice. I've spoken with law enforcement from all 50 states on countless occasions. I've met with judges, prosecutors, community leaders, victims, and their families, uh, and the FBI that I see every single day and that I hear about from all of them is an FBI that does the right thing in the right way with, with rigor, with professionalism, with objectivity, with skill, uh, and I will stack our workforce up against any, anywhere in the world, any time. And the Americans should have deep confidence in those people. And I will add, 
that when it comes to perceptions of the FBI, that the number of Americans all across this country applying to be special agents in the FBI has been going up, up significantly over the past three years. At a time when, as I hear all the time, law enforcement all over this country is having the opposite experience. And I think that speaks very well of Americans in every state represented on this committee. Uh, thank you. Yield back. General Lady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina for five minutes, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, Mr. McCall said the border is wide open. Director Ray testified about an elevated threat of guns and money and um, drugs uh, across the border. Uh, Mr. Guest laid out a lot of the details about the record-breaking numbers, and, I, and he, he ended up having to talk more than get an answer from you on something. I just want to ask you, I, I've heard you in the Judiciary Com Committee recently in the summer testify that the border is secure. Secretary Mayorkas, do you continue to maintain that the border is secure? Yes, and we are working day in and day out to enhance its security, Congressman. Right. Thank you, we sir. Have, so, we have remarkable... I, I, I get it. I just wanted to make sure that that's, that still is your uh, your assessment. It, it's Director very, Ray... It is, and it's very important, if I may. Well, I, don't, just, I, I know there's just not enough time for a lot of explanation, and you've got written testimony and so forth. I just wanted to understand that that's your position still. I think it is a... Um, it is a, a, a position that denies reality respectfully, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to say, no, I think the situation's changed or something like that. Director Ray, uh, do you believe that the border is secure? Well, I can only speak to border security from our narrow lane, but, but I can speak to it from that lane. Uh, what I would say is that we see uh, significant criminal threats coming from south of the border, uh, whether it's guns, drugs, uh, money, violence. We see transnational criminal organizations uh, that are sending their drugs here and that are using street gangs here to distribute it, and that contributes to the violent crime crisis here. Uh, we've had takedowns just in the last few months uh, that I could give you as an example. You know, I'll give you just one quick one. You know, in Phoenix, we uh, had a takedown working with CBP, who are phenomenal partners, I should add, uh, where we seized, in one vehicle interdiction, enough fentanyl to kill the equivalent of the entire state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's, that's very one troubling. one vehicle interdiction. Thank you, Director Ray. Director Abizay, uh, does the NCTC assess a significant threat from the historic level of uncontrolled crossing at the southern border? Thank you. Uh, we don't, actually. Uh, border security is really important. If we look at the nature of the threat and how it's evolved here in the United States homeland, it's been striking how the evolution to lone actors actually reflects how much more difficult it is for terrorists to enter into the United States. We look historically at the kind of attacks we've experienced here in the homeland. None of them have been connected to um, major illegal crossings or otherwise from the southwest border. Right. That said, Ray, it remains a top intelligence priority. Director Ray spoke to that earlier about what has historically been true. It makes me mindful of the 9-11 of the, of the report, that chapter that said the system is bl was blinking red. It was a failure of the United States government agencies to anticipate a, a threat that should have been obvious to everyone. So it troubles me that the official response is, we don't think that's much of a threat. We have an unprecedented number of people coming across the border. We, a lot of them are being interdicted, but released into the United States without enough scrutiny. A whole lot more apparently coming in without being interdicted at all. And the answer, the official answer is, mm, we don't think there's a terrorism problem there. It just hadn't happened in the past. I think unfortunately we're gonna find out if it happens in the future. Um, reporting from The Intercept, uh, focused on the Department of Homeland Security's, and I guess this has been the focal, focal point for it, interactions with social media uh, companies. One, one thing it related was that DHS sent an email to Twitter about a Twitter account that could imperil election system integrity. The user had 56 followers in a bio that indicated, had references to weed shops. Secretary Mayorkas, does that kind of, that, the level of interaction with social media platforms, and that one specifically, that anecdote, not suggest that DHS is engaged in egregious overreach in, that, that threatens the First Amendment? 
Uh, Congressman, uh, I would note that the, uh, the Intercept article uh, focused its attention on the disinformation activities that preceded our uh, administration. Let me assure you uh, that our work to address disinformation, which is a tool that our uh, uh, nation state adversaries uh, seek to employ to sow discord in this country, is something that is very, very respectful of the civil rights and civil liberties of individuals as well as their privacy rights. You maintain that always, but let me just ask, when you say it's respectful, are you attempting to uh, conduct censorship by proxy as a means of evading the First Amendment? We absolutely do not. My time's expired. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member as well and uh, appreciate greatly the commentary that you both gave earlier with reference to collegiality and an effort to get the optimum from this committee based upon the things that we can agree upon. I thank you both. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, I'm on a mission of mercy today. I'm on a mission of mercy because of our immigration laws and a need for comprehensive immigration reform. Please allow me to call to your attention, uh, Mr. Secretary, the case of uh, one Mr. Jaime Avalos Rosales. I'd like to have additional conversations with you about this because there is no way for me to give you the intelligence necessary at this time, the entirety of it. In uh, 1996, Mr. Avalos came to this country at the age of one year. In 2013, he received DACA. He graduated from a high school in Houston, Texas, Bel Air High, 2014. No criminal record, Mr. Secretary. Married his wife, Yariana, and they now have a child who's approximately one year of age. Mr. Secretary, pursuant to the laws, he went back to Mexico, to Juarez, to the consulate, in an effort to submit himself for reentry into the country in a lawful fashion. The law permits this. It was discovered that he was brought back to Mexico at about the age of seven, came at the age of one, taken back at the age of seven. And uh, because he was taken back to Mexico at the age of seven, a child, he is now barred from this country for 10 years. He had an appointment with the consulate, went there in good faith, came here as a child, went back as a child, and because he went back as a child, he is now barred for 10 years. Won't be with his baby. Won't have Christmas with the child. A very sad circumstance that if it, if it doesn't impact one's heart, I, I'm just sorry for the lack of sympathy and empathy that some people may have. So I'm appealing for some help. He's not a criminal. He didn't, he didn't bring himself here. He didn't come on his own volition. He came as a child. And I'm trying my best to bring him home. I'm going to Mexico to visit with him. Uh, I'll be taking his wife and his baby. She's an American citizen. Baby was born in this country. They'll be going with me. I'd like to bring him home. And I would like to ask as much help as I can get from you. Uh, and from our government. Let me say this before you uh, give a brief response. I appreciate President Biden. He inherited a tough, tough job, tough position, but he knew what he was inheriting, and he has taken up the challenge admirably, admirably. And I compliment you on doing the best that you can under the circumstances that exist and the laws that exist. The border is about as secure as it can be given the laws that we have. It is lawful. 
for people to ask for asylum. That's lawful. It is lawful for us to consider the request. About as secure as it can be given the laws that we have. You can't change the laws, but we can. And that's why we, many of us, keep insisting on comprehensive immigration reform so that we can deal with the situations that include Mr. Jaime Avalos Rosales. This needs to be dealt with. Shouldn't be banned because his mother took him home to register his birth as a child of seven years. There is a law that uh, requires persons who leave the country once you're here to go back to your consulate and then apply and be given consideration. But if you leave and come back to the country prior to your making that application, you're banned. So I'm hoping that we can do something to help him. And I'd like to know if I can visit with you, talk more with you about this, uh, and, and many other cases, of course, but I'd like to visit with you. I yield to you, sir. Mr. Secretary. Congressman, um, I am, of course, um, not familiar with the case um, that you have um, uh, described. I can say that um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, the agency that deals with the administration of our legal immigration system, receives on almost a weekly basis uh, cases that present <coughs> tremendous heartbreak and sadness uh, because of how broken indeed our system is. And those pleas uh, for mercy come from both sides of the aisle. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey for five minutes, Mr. Mandrew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Racking Member. Um, just very briefly, um, I respect Mr. Green very much, uh, and I, I feel for his passion. I'd like to say, though, that there are a lot of people right now in the United States of America that are going through their own personal hells for many reasons, whether it's drug addiction, whether it's homelessness, whether it's problems that our Americans who live here and work here and try to function here have. And uh, I think our immigration system, respectfully, we are not doing as good as we could do. And I believe that we could do much, much better. And quite frankly, we were doing much, much better. Um, Secretary Mayorkas, when you testified before this committee in September of last year, you stated that DHS continues enforcing our immigration laws. And to my surprise, you said that we were responsibly managing our border. In the last fiscal year, there were over 2.3 million recorded migrant encounters at the southwest border, which included 98 non-U.S. citizens who were on the terrorist screening data list, data set. As you know, these figures do not represent those who avoided detection, which was estimated to be around 600,000. To attempt to combat the crisis on the border, you have deployed highly trained and highly skilled federal air marshals to the border to perform non-law enforcement duties such as hospital watch, transportation, and welfare checks. There have even been reports that marshals are performing janitorial duties. I have the largest air marshal training center in the United States of America in my district, and I've seen firsthand how talented and capable they are. DHS is removing hundreds of air marshals from the skies during one of the busiest travel seasons of the year, even though you have stated that America's aviation infrastructure is a very high threat and is a target. Furthermore, DHS is even classifying how many high-risk flights are not being covered due to your decision to deploy air marshals to the border. How do you justify this deployment? Don't you think it would make more sense to hire more Border Patrol agents who are trained for this and finish the wall, yes, finish the wall, rather than continue to mishandle the crisis. But now we're mishandling it 
at the, at the expense of aviation security. So where we had one problem, which is a terrible problem, and I disagree with you thoroughly that uh, there isn't a problem there. We can turn the TV on now on just about any news station and you can see what's going on. This is not rocket science. It's not complicated. The American public can see it. Everybody can see it and it affects the whole country. But instead of having just one problem, now we have two problems because what we're doing to the air marshals. Enough is enough. Why can't we just do the right thing, the simple thing, and the functional thing? Why can't we go back to where we were, where we had so much less of a problem? Congressman, a, a few thoughts. Uh, first of all, thank you for accurately um, describing uh, the expertise, the professionalism, uh, and the bravery of our federal air marshals. Of course, it is uh, a false uh, that uh, they are deployed uh, to the border to um, uh, conduct janitorial services. We have contract personnel. Uh, to do that. Um, you make a very, very important point. You ask the question, uh, why uh, can we not um, hire more Border Patrol agents um, out in the field? And I think that's a very appropriate question, uh, and uh, there's a very compelling answer for that. You know, for the first time since 2011, we have presented uh, to Congress a budget uh, that seeks uh, to plus up our Border Patrol agent personnel. We request a budget uh, to fund 300 more Border Patrol agents. Every single year since 2006, I believe it is, the Department of Homeland Security has relied on the Department of Defense to augment its resources to address the challenges uh, at the border. So this is not something new. I look forward to working with you to see what we can do to pass a budget that calls for additional resources for the Department of Homeland Security to address the challenges, not only at the southern border, but all of the challenges. Secretary, I, I appreciate that, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I have like five seconds here. Um, the problem with the budget is there's so many unpalatable, unacceptable other parts to it that, as you know, it's the old game that's always played in politics. Jam a budget or jam a bill or whatever it is with all kinds of other issues and initiatives that a lot of people don't want to see. If we had a standalone uh, appropriation to do this, to fund this, you would see it go through in a second. So if you want to fight for that, I'll fight by your side to get more Border Patrol agents. I'll talk to the president, as I know that you would, and let's see what happens. But it shouldn't be jammed with all kinds of other initiatives that we don't want. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. For five minutes. Thank the chair and the ranking member for this uh, very important hearing and oversight assessment. Let me add my appreciation to uh, ranking member Katko for the years of service that we've had to work together uh, in a mutual commitment to securing the homeland. We thank you for your service to the nation uh, and as well uh, continue to uh, thank you for uh, your previous service. Thank the chairman again for uh, bringing us together around this important issue and to our witnesses. Uh, let me acknowledge the 20th year of Homeland Security uh, and the men and women who worked under that umbrella to thank them for their service. Uh, Director Ray, um, let me um, also affirm uh, the admiration, respect of the FBI, and I would frankly say law, law enforcement around the nation and express my um, concern for the incident, the violent incident that happened in Cincinnati uh, and appreciate um, uh, the fact that uh, the safety of those men and women uh, let me um, build on uh, the tragedy uh, that uh, uh, fell upon uh, the second in line to the presidency, the Speaker of the House, and ask the question about the depth and intenseness of political violence. Uh, again, our time is brief, but I'd like to yield to the Secretary first, uh, Director Ray, and to uh, Director Abbasad, uh, if we might. And I, I do have other questions, so let me just quickly yield. Just the depth of political violence, which means speech driving people to violence. Congresswoman, we, of course, um, uh, are engaged when, in fact, um, there's a connectivity between an ideological view, a political view, and violence. That's when we get involved, and uh, we all, um, the Director, 
uh, and I'm in our opening uh, statements and in response to preliminary questions spoke of the gravity of the threat that lone actors and small cells pose when they are driven to violence uh, because of uh, political ideology, ideologies of hate, anti-government sentiments, personal grievances, and other narratives propagated on online platforms. This is one of the gravest terrorism-related threats we face in the homeland. Director Ray. Uh, well, Congresswoman, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, we have seen a clear trend in this country over the last several years of people across the political spectrum choosing to express their anger or upset uh, at someone or about something through violence. Uh, and that is a very alarming trend. As Secretary Mayorkas referenced, it is exacerbated uh, online. Uh, but it is a clear phenomenon that we are having to contend with uh, that started several years ago. It's going up. It is going up. Thank you. Direct. Uh, I would concur with my colleagues. You know, as we look at the numbers since 2010, we see that um, domestic violent extremism accounts for 47 attacks, over 152 deaths. Uh, and that actually pales in comparison to the 45 attacks that we've seen since 9-11 by foreign terrorist organizations. Uh, let me just, can I get a yes or no answer on this because I have some other questions. Is a cyber threat coming from China and Russia intense, continuing, and ongoing? I, I, uh, cyber threat, I will defer to my uh, colleagues in the FBI and DHS. Director Ray? Yes. Thank you. Um, Director Mayorkas, let, let me try to, uh, my understanding is that immigration, defense of the border, or protection of the border is a federal uh, responsibility. Is that not correct? That is correct. Have you seen any positive impact from the $4 billion being spent by Governor Abbott of the state of Texas, who continues to malign the work of the federal government and to some extent interfere with it and cause uh, the National Guard, some of whom have committed suicide, uh, to Texas National Guard uh, to be strained? I, I'm going to ask that question in the context of what D Director Ray said in terms of the answer to the question about security at the border. And I think it is important to distinguish between, even though we want to stop that flow, to distinguish fleeing families uh, with children from Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, et cetera, from the work, uh, the, the, the re strain of cartels, uh, smuggling of human smuggling, smuggling of fentanyl, those criminal elements we're all fighting, I assume, to bring that down. Can you distinguish and tell me whether you've seen any impact from the $4 billion that one state happens to be using of state tax dollars taken away from the needs of the people of Texas that has impacted the work that you're doing as a federal officer to protect the border? Congresswoman, let me, um, let me answer the question this way. We advance the law enforcement mission when we work collectively, collaboratively, and in a coordinated way. When there is a deliberate effort to not coordinate, uh, it can and indeed has been quite counterproductive. General ladies, time Thank has you. expired. Chair recognized General Lady from Iowa, Ms. Miller Meeks, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member Katko. And uh, first, I'd also like to thank all of our witnesses for coming before the committee today. And I'm glad we're finally having the ability to dis seriously discuss the threats we're facing, particularly along our southwest border. And let me also say that prior to January 20th, 2021, we had lawful operational control of the southern border. The number of unaccompanied alien children, UACs, continue uh, encountered along the southwest border has nearly doubled since 2019 and continues to increase, surpassing a record high in fiscal year 2021, approaching nearly 153,000 this fiscal year. We've heard reports of children being sent alone. I've encountered them um, when I've made trips to the border across dangerous terrain with nothing but a relative's name and address pinned on their shirt. Some of these children so young as to not know their own uh, name or to whom they're supposed to uh, be sent. We've seen Border Patrol agents bravely fight to save young kids and infants in medical distress and in crossing the river. 
And when we've encountered these families, and I distinctly remember an occasion with uh, Representative Carlos Jimenez and Representative Maria Salazar who spoke their language, asking them specifically whether or not the Biden administration's policies, often cited directly by these migrants crossing the border, encourage foreign nationals to send their children to seek entry into the United States despite dire conditions at the border. Secretary Mayorkas, are the Biden administration's policies encouraging and increasing the pull factor for unaccompanied minors, UACs, to come into this country? Congresswoman, a few thoughts, if I may. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, capturing the vulnerability of un unaccompanied children uh, that migrate from their countries of origin and seek a, a, a um, safety, uh, not only in the United States, but elsewhere in the hemisphere, as I said at the very outset. Um, and um, I don't Sir, know. Sir, I want to be respectful. Present. I have limited yes, time. So that this is a challenge that we are experiencing throughout the hemisphere. I also want to thank you for uh, recognizing the bravery of the Border Patrol. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to relate back to my instances of appearing at the border and hearing directly from people crossing the border that the administration's policies, in fact, are a pull factor. What, given that, what actions are being taken at the department to keep these kids safe, safe, and stem the flow of unaccompanied, stem the flow of UACs crossing illegally into the United States across dangerous terrain? So, so a few things. Of, of course, I, I disagree with the premise uh, um, of the pull factor. Uh, and as I was um, saying, this is a hemispheric uh, challenge. We're seeing a tremendous amount of upheaval throughout the Western Hemisphere, authoritarian regimes, poverty, violence, corruption, uh, and the like. We are doing a number of things. And let me give you two examples. One is we're taking it to the smugglers in an unprecedented way. Uh, throughout the Department of Homeland Security, throughout the interagency, and with our, our partner uh, countries to the south of our border. We have, uh, in the last year, um, uh, conducted more than 6,000 arrests in an unprecedented disruption effort to attack the smuggling organizations that seek to exploit the vulnerable. Thank you. And uh, two, I, I can say that when two, I've been to the border and talked with the agents, uh, the uh, the cartels seem to have tremendous control over yes. what happens. If I may, After being, just, I, Sir, I only have one minute and 16 seconds left. After being apprehended by the DHS, unaccompanied alien children are transferred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement within the Department of Health and Human Services. While this is supposed to occur within 72 hours of arrival, decrease in the amount of time children reside in CBP uh, facilities, many unaccompanied children have remained in CBC facilities longer than the time allotted under federal law. Is the large scale of UACs crossing the border contributing to these overstays in CBC facilities, and how is this being addressed, number one? Number two, how is the DHS managing the threat of sexual predators at the border during CBT facility detentions, as well as during the transfer of children to different locations? And if you don't have time to answer, you can respond to us. Uh, in uh, Congresswoman, um, uh, we're also building lawful pathways, such as a Central American Minors Program. So children do not place, the, um, and their parents do not place their lives in the hands of exploitative smugglers. The information that you have with respect to the length of stay in a Border Patrol facility is, um, uh, I think, uh, quite dated. Uh, that was certainly a challenge that we faced in March of 2021, but we have taken considerable measures uh, to meet the 72-hour uh, time frame, and I look forward to providing you with further information. Please. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, I yield my time. Gentlelady yields back. Pursuant to the order of the committee of today, the committee stands in recess for approximately five minutes.
His commitment to bipartisanship and his commitment to the work of this committee uh, has been uh, uplifting. To all of our public servants seated here today, thank you for your service and commitment to the American people. Uh, my question is really around cybersecurity. That's uh, something that I've um, really had a keen, keen interest in. And uh, we have recently, this year, uh, passed legislation that I authored requiring the reporting of major cyber incidents to CISA. And although CISA has uh, three and a half years to issue a final rule, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, none of us want to wait that long. Uh, my hope is that swift implementation will yield important security benefits, eliminate duplicative reporting frameworks, and encourage harmonization across the interagency. Toward that end, I have two questions for you. Uh, what is DHS doing to support, and more specifically, expedite this rulemaking so we don't have to wait years to see results? And how is DHS working with the SEC and other regulators to harmonize new requirements through, for example, the Cyber Incident Reporting Council established um, in, in, in Circea? Congresswoman, uh, thank you so much for championing um, this critical um, security uh, effort, cybersecurity uh, effort. We, we are already engaging with the private sector um, in preparation for the promulgation of the regulations that will in, implement uh, the new legislation. It is vitally important, as you and other members of this committee know who have championed uh, this imperative, the public-private partnership is the, the bedrock, the foundation uh, of the cybersecurity of our ecosystem. So we already have begun to engage with the private sector in anticipation of the regulations that we will um, issue number one. And number two, we have a council that we are um, chairing uh, that is working across the interagency to ensure, to the best of our abilities, the harmonization of the reporting requirements. And I should say that we have also taken that critical harmonization um, need and expanded it in the international domain, speaking with our international partners and seeing what we can do given the multinational footprint of so many of our companies to see what we can do to harmonize the landscape internationally as well as domestically. Well, I'm happy to hear that, uh, you know, we're sort of prepping, but do you have a sense of whether we can expedite uh, the rulemaking so that it doesn't take us uh, the, the three and a half uh, estimated years uh, to, to get to the final rule. So, so I believe that there are set time frames in the statutory regime with respect to the promulgation of uh, regulation. I think we have, if I'm not mistaken, and, and I'll correct myself subsequently if I am, that we have 18 months. Uh, um, we have what I would respectfully submit as the preeminent regulatory team to ensure the swift promulgation of the necessary implementing regulations. In addition to the cyber incident reporting, I see the Cyber Safety Review Board, the CSRB, is another innovative way this administration has tried to better understand cyber threats. Does the administration intend to seek authorization for the CSRB? And if so, what should those authorities entail? And what does the CSRB plan to study next? So that is, um, um, Congresswoman, thank you so much for recognizing uh, the tremendous value of the Cyber Safety Review Board. And it's very important to emphasize that that is a board that is not focused on accountability, but is um, focused on the a diagnosis of the challenge and remediation uh, of uh, any potential harm that the challenge uh, presents. Its first project was the Log4j uh, vulnerability. It is now uh, preparing to issue a report. Um, and one of the things that we are considering is the authorization of the CSRB and what we can, what further support we can uh, receive from Congress. And we're very appreciative of the support we've received to date. Mr. Secretary, in response to uh, uh, Congresswoman Slotkin's uh, question, you raised the issue of cyber hygiene and the work that's being done uh, from the administration standpoint, certainly from the congressional standpoint, I'd like to include the private sector. One of the things that I've been concerned about is that uh, we can't amplify enough 
uh, the need for there to be a national movement around cyber hygiene. Every weak link presents a, a vector for our adversaries to take us down. And so I want to put on your radar as you speak with the private sector, perhaps looking at some public service announcements so that there's an educational campaign that is consistently out there in the public and that uh, we grow up with the habit, like uh, putting on our seatbelts of uh, doing uh, regularly uh, addressing our cyber hygiene. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back. Chair recognizes General Lady from Tennessee, Ms. Hoshbarger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses for being here today. Um, I'm going to read a statement. This is for all the witnesses. Late last month, Forbes and other press reported that TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, planned to use TikTok to monitor the uh, physical location of specific Americans for the purposes of surveilling individual U.S. citizens. And as you know, TikTok is close to signing a CFIUS contract, and the Treasury Department's been assessing the national security risk of the foreign ownership of TikTok, including its CCP ties and whether the platform enables the Chinese government to access U.S. persons' data. Uh, the first question is a yes or no. It's do you assess that TikTok is a significant national security threat given the accusations that the company specifically targets U.S. persons and given the bot dance and TikTok ties to the CCP? And the second part of that question is yes or no. Is the CCP leveraging the application as a tool to collect information about U.S. citizens for purposes other than targeted ads and content? Anyone on the panel? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I, taking the first question, I would say we do have national security concerns, uh, at least from the FBI's end, uh, about TikTok. They uh, include the possibility that the Chinese government could use it to control data collection on millions of users or control the recommendation algorithm, uh, which could be used for influence operations if they so chose, or uh, to control software on millions of devices, uh, which gives the opportunity to potentially technically compromise personal devices. So there's a number of concerns there. As to what is actually happening and actually being done, uh, that's probably something that would be uh, better addressed in, uh, in a close, uh, classified setting, and I could see what information we might be able to share that way, but that's probably not much more than I could add to that, other than to say it is certainly something that's on our radar, and we share your concerns. Yes, uh, thank you for that, and I'd love to have that closed briefing. Um, has ByteDance responded to, to allegations that uh, their internal auditing system specifically targeted any members of the U.S. government, activists, public figures, or journalists, yes or no? I'll have to see if we can get back to you on that. I'm not sure that I can give the answer right here at this moment. Okay. Are you informing the Treasury's view uh, through the CFIUS process of the national security threat it poses? I'm sorry, ma'am. I repeat the question. I just couldn't hear you very well. Are you informing Treasury's view through the CFIUS process of the national security threat it poses to the United States? Uh, yes, our, the FBI's Foreign Investment Unit uh, working through the Department of Justice is, is part of the CFIUS process uh, and, and would be relevant. Our input would be taken into account in any agreements that might be made to address the issue. Okay, last part of that question is what is currently being done to investigate the CCP's involvement in TikTok ownership direction and our access? And the reason I asked that is there was a... Um, a current 60 minute segment highlighting the stark differences between the Chinese owned TikTok company that allows kid in, kids in China to view a totally different app, a clean app. And what is shown in the US, they call it an opium version that is designed to hook American children um, on an unsafe version of the uh, video based platform and, you know, offering a healthier version and a limited viewing. Of 40 minutes for those children in China, which is unacceptable, and parents need to know this. But what's currently being done to investigate the CCP's involvement in TikTok? Well, as to uh, any specific investigative work, uh, I could see whether some of that could be incorporated into the classified briefing I referred to. 
there's obviously limits on what I can share uh, in terms of discussing a specific ongoing investigation. But what I would say is that you've uh, highlighted two very, very important threats. One, of course, something we're all concerned about, which is the threat to uh, our youth online. But the second yes. is the threat specifically from the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party and the ways in which their laws are used uh, as an aggressive weapon uh, against companies, both U.S. companies and Chinese companies. Uh, under Chinese law, Chinese companies are required to essentially, and I'm going to shorthand here, basically do whatever the Chinese government wants them to in terms of sharing information or, or serving as a tool of the Chinese government. And so that's plenty of reason by itself to be extremely concerned. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to the classified briefing and I appreciate your time. And with that, Chairman, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Swarwell, for five minutes. Uh, thank you. And, and to the witnesses and the people in law enforcement that you represent, you are owed our thanks uh, for your service to our country. You're not owed the bitter, divisive, cruel, violent rhetoric we heard from our colleague from Louisiana. And that's a rhetoric that the voters rejected, uh, an extreme rhetoric that voters rejected last Tuesday. And our chairman of the committee, Mr. Thompson, was also not owed uh, that display. Director Ray, anti-Semitism is on the rise across America, and the White House has recently proposed $360 million for nonprofit security grants uh, that can assist community centers, and, and also Secretary Mayorkas. We funded that to the tune of $250 million uh, in this committee, and it was also a partnership between Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Katko. But if we provided additional funding, what would that mean for combating anti-Semitism in America? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman uh, Swalwell. Um, you know, the nonprofit security grant program, when I first um, addressed it, was funded at $180 million, and we're grateful for the support of, of this committee in funding it at the level of $250 million. What we would do if that funding increased to $360 million, which we certainly uh, advocate that it does, is enable us to also fund target-rich, resource-poor institutions that are vulnerable uh, to uh, uh, attacks. And that is um, includes um, places of worship, um, that guard against anti-Semitism. It is true of churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, all sorts of nonprofit uh, organizations, including historically black colleges and universities that have seen a tremendous uptick in bomb threats, as Director Ray uh, referenced earlier. That is much needed funding because there are target rich but resource poor uh, institutions, schools, places of worship, that need to enhance their security against an ever-increasing threat. Great. Thank you, uh, Secretary. Director Ray, uh, many of my Republican colleagues uh, have run on a defund the FBI platform. They've made T-shirts, uh, hats uh, to fund their campaigns. If the FBI was defunded, would that hurt or help terrorism investigations? Uh, it would hurt. If, Just in the last several years, the FBI has thwarted terrorist attacks uh, in places like Las Vegas, Tampa, New York, Cleveland, Kansas City, Pittsburgh. And those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Um, and so we need more funding for those if, efforts, not less. If the FBI was defunded, uh, would that hurt or help child exploitation uh, investigations? It would hurt. Uh, we have, th have a very, very active violent crimes against children program. We are literally arresting thousands of child predators and rescuing hundreds and hundreds of kids. Um, so again, we need more funding for that, not less. And if the FBI was defunded, would that hurt or help COVID fraud investigations for money that went into the communities uh, during the time of COVID? Well, again, it would hurt. Uh, we have a very active COVID fraud uh, investigative program working with uh, other agencies as partners, Department of Justice, Inspector General, et cetera. And given the uh, remarkable amounts of money uh, 
that were involved, courtesy to, of this Congress, it's important that we ensure the integrity of, of that spend so that it not be wasted on, uh, I've been briefed by agents on cases involving you know, violent gangs that have tapped into some of the COVID fraud money. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Marcus, do you support the GOP plan for the border? Um, uh, Congressman, I very much look forward to working in a bipartisan way to address um, the need to enhance um, the, our border sure. security. I guess, do you know I what the work, GOP plan is for the border? Uh, I, I do not. I want to work in a bipartisan way to address what is a unanimously understood to be a broken immigration system. I, I agree, Secretary, and, and I, my point is I, I've not heard a plan. I've just heard grievances. And finally, Director Ray, um, last week uh, the quote-unquote parliament uh, in Iran voted uh, to execute 15,000 protesters, many of them teenagers and, and women, and one of those members of parliament is actually uh, in the United States right now uh, at the UN, presum presumptively under diplomatic cover. Do we need more resources or should we reconsider who we allow to come to the United States, you know, after you've voted for such an atrocity? It, it just really concerns me that people could be enjoying themselves in New York after signing, you know, a death warrant for 15,000 innocent Iranians who just want freedom. Gentlemen's time has expired. Director, you can't answer the question. Well, I, what I would say is that the Iranian regime across multiple vectors uh, has become more aggressive, more brazen, and more dangerous. Uh, and I would just point to everything just in the, again, just in the, maybe the last 18 months, a cyber attack on a children's hospital, an attempt to assassinate the former U.S. national security advisor in the United States, and an attempt to kidnap a journalist from right smack in the middle of New York City. So if that's not enough to convince us that the regime is a threat, I don't know what is. Great. Thank you, the, Director. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Jimenez, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I want to um, echo the um, thoughts of some of my colleagues uh, that uh, Mr. Katko, I know he's gone, but uh, certainly um, a, a great ranking, ranking member and the way that this uh, committee has uh, conducted its business in a bipartisan manner, uh, that's to be commended. Um, Mr. Ray, um, I, I read in your testimony that you consider domestic violent, violent extremists to be the greatest threat to um, to our you know health and, and well being here in the United States. Do you do you do you stand by that? Well, let me just make a slightly finer point on it because precision is important here. The greatest threat to us in the homeland is lone actors in small cells, typically radicalized online, using easily accessible weapons against soft targets. That group includes two categories: both domestic violent extremists, and homegrown violent extremists, which are foreign terrorist inspired. So they're very similar, but it's two big buckets. Do you, do you know how many, how, many, how many fatalities we had in 2020 from, uh, from DVEs? I don't have the, the number of deaths off the top of my head, but I know that in 2020, uh, the most lethal attacks or the, la the lethal attacks that we had came from what we categorize as anti-government, anti-authority violent extremism, which includes both anarchist violent extremism as well as militia violence. Yeah, I think I read there was something like four. And four, four is too many, you know, that's, you know, for the four people that, that died. Do you know how many people die per day from fentanyl overdose? I don't have that figure. Would, I, would, it, would it shock you to say that over 200 die daily from fentanyl, fentanyl overdoses? Uh, I, I know the numbers are eye-popping. Eye-popping. Um, who controls that trade? Who is pouring in this deadly drug into the United States? Uh, transnational criminal organizations, uh, especially the cartels. Which ones? From where? Uh, typically from Mexico. Would you consider that to be a terrorist act? Well, I certainly consider it to be a major, major law enforcement threat and a major, major security threat. Whether I would call it a national security threat gets into sort of terminology, but certainly it is a major threat to the homeland uh, of, of almost epidemic proportions. So an organization that's killing over 200 Americans every single day 
you have difficulty in saying that they're not terrorizing us? Well, again, in my world, terrorism has a very specific legal definition. It is certainly a national security threat. So what are we doing about it? So we know we have, we have an organizations across the border, and they're not some faraway land. They're right across the border. They're killing tens of thousands of Americans every year. What exactly are we doing about that? Well, as to true border security, obviously I would you know, defer to Secretary Mayorkas, but on our end to deal with the transnational criminal organizations, there are a number of things we're doing. First, we have transnational organized crime task forces with not just agents, but lots and lots of state and local law enforcement officers who work with us to go after the cartels. Second, we have safe streets task forces, which deal with a related part, which is the violent gangs that work with those cartels and going after those. Third, we have border liaison officers in all of the field offices that we have that are on the border. And I've visited all of them myself and walked around not just with our people, but with the CBP officers. And those folks ensure cross-border assistance. Uh, we have LEGATS, uh, which is legal attache offices uh, in Mexico. And in fact, last year, we were able to apprehend two of the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitives, which is progress. Uh, so those are some of the things we're doing, but it is a major, major concern for sure. Have we done anything with, with the government of Mexico, warned them, et cetera, that they need to step up uh, their war against these cartels? Because again, these cartels are killing tens of thousands of Americans. You know, a, a foreign group in, 20, in 2000 uh, killed about 3,000 Americans and we responded by waging war for about 20 years. Uh, halfway around the world. There are foreign groups right now across the border that are killing tens of thousands of Americans every single year, and we don't seem to be doing much about it. And, uh, and frankly, I'm upset about that. Uh, we seem to be focused on, on domestic violent extremists, which we should, okay, but we're not, which killed four people in, in 2020, and we seem to be turning a blind eye to organizations that, that are killing tens of thousands of Americans. And we also seem to be doing not much about stopping the flow of this drug coming into the United States through our southern border. Thank you. My time is up, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, let me just correct the record. 2019, most lethal year uh, for DVE attacks. Um, DEVs were responsible for 32, um, 32 deaths in 2019. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Nevada, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, and first, let me thank the department and the secretary for extending the TPS protections to Haiti, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, Sudan, and uh, Nepal. I have a very diverse district, many people from Central America who will be benefited from this, and I just want to thank you. I appreciate that uh, effort. My first question, though, will go to the secretary, and it's pretty specific about my district. I apologize if it's too parochial, but Las Vegas is very excited to be getting the Formula One event for next November. This, they're going to be racing for three days up and down the strip. They're going to be close to all these major hotels. A lot of people are going to be there watching this uh, race, and I want to make sure that the event receives the appropriate SEER, I think is the acronym, Special Event Assessment Rating. You, I just heard the uh, director mention that Las Vegas is a place where they're always looking for uh, terrorists, or we've seen terrorist threats. So could you talk about how the criteria for these SEER designations work, how it's been updated, how today differs from so much in the past? that would uh, accommodate uh, the event in Las Vegas? Congresswoman, um, we are evaluating right now the Formula One race uh, that is scheduled uh, to occur in Las Vegas to identify the appropriate SEER rating uh, that it deserves. Uh, please um, uh, forgive me, but I must, I must respond to the Congressman's uh, statement that preceded your question. Uh, it is uh, candidly, outrageous to say that we are not doing anything to address the transnational criminal organizations. We have incredibly brave law enforcement officers every day risking their lives uh, to battle 
uh, the criminality of those TCOs. And I look forward to sharing with the Congressman everything that we are doing in that regard. Congresswoman, I would be pleased to um, uh, share with you what we are doing to refine the SEER rating process. That's a rating process that we use to identify the security level of particular uh, events in the United States. Uh, we actually uh, just met as a group and discussed this uh, yesterday. So I look forward uh, to sharing with you some details. That review is underway. Well, thank you very much. We want it to be a fun environment, but uh, we also want it to be a very safe environment for all the people who come to enjoy this kind of race. Uh, and related to this, Mr. Secretary, uh, tourism is coming back, international tourism. And we want to encourage that because it's such a big part of our economy. Foreign tourists stay longer, they spend more, they visit regional areas, not just downtown Las Vegas. I wonder what's going on as y'all try to accommodate this increase in tourism again, whether it's with TSA or with customs or uh, COVID, all of those kind of uh, considerations. Congresswoman, we are incredibly excited about the fact that uh, travel to the United States uh, has uh, resumed in full force. And in fact, I think the latest figures uh, exceed uh, the patterns of uh, 2019 uh, before the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, gripped uh, this country uh, and uh, the world in, in, full, um, uh, in full force. Um, the TSA uh, personnel uh, have emphasized um, uh, the, um, the, the pre-check process, which of course uh, really assists us and supports us in approaching uh, travel security in a risk-based manner. We are seeing more than 15,000 enrollments per day in the TSA pre-check process. Our, our Border Patrol personnel are also working on technology, new technologies and innovations to facilitate the travel process, as is TSA. Uh, there was uh, quite a, um, a robust article uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago in the Washington Post that described some of the technological innovations that TSA specifically has displayed. We have a partnership uh, with Apple, uh, for example, that we are, of course, open to other vendors uh, accessing and, uh, and using um, for uh, a mobile uh, driver's license identification process. We are looking at innovation and technology and the capabilities to further facilitate the travel experience and to enhance security at the very same time. Is staffing improving in terms of uh, needing additional personnel? One of the things that we hope Congress passes is um, uh, um, our request to provide uh, pay uh, parity for our TSA personnel. The disparity that our TSA personnel suffer in pay makes recruiting and retention very difficult. Uh, so we hope that Congress passes the much needed le legislation to provide pay fairness for our TSA personnel. Thank you, I know my time is up, but uh, I would certainly support that. And I know the chairman of this committee has been working hard on that issue. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Kamet, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and good afternoon. Thank you all for being here with us this afternoon. With so many threats to deal with, as has been pointed out today, it's really a shame that we have a major one that uh, we have to contend with that's completely unnecessary and manufactured. So we'll just jump right in on that one. Secretary Mayorkas, you've stated that you believe that the Southwest border is secure. Giving me just the number and nothing else, no additional commentary, tell me how many gotaways there were for fiscal year 22. Just the number, please. Secretary Mayorkas, I have a litany of questions. Just the number, please. Thank you. You are correct. It is 600,000. Now, can you answer definitively with data backing up your answer that none of the 600,000 individuals who are now in the United States amongst our communities that got away uh, are gang members or criminals? Uh, your question uh, highlights precisely why we have sought to prioritize national security and public safety threats. I'm so glad to hear you say that. In our immigration and customs I'm enforcement 
I'm really glad to hear you say that. Efforts. I'm going to have to reclaim my time because I've got a lot to get through. So as you know, probably then in fiscal year 22, CBP arrested nearly 30,000 illegals attempting to enter the country who were previously convicted of a crime. Now, of those arrested in just the number, no additional commentary, how many have uh, claimed asylum? Uh, Congresswoman, I'll have to get back uh, to you with specific okay. with, with specific numbers. Thank you. Now, officially, there have been 2.4 million illegals that have been encountered at the southwest border in fiscal year 22. That doesn't include the 600,000 gotaways. So giving me just the number, and again, no additional commentary, can you tell me how many illegals have been released into the United States that were encountered at the southwest border? Put, putting aside your terminology, may I correct you because you've actually cited inaccurate facts. In well, this is question. actually from your website. No, it isn't. It is. And I'd be happy to provide it with you. Congresswoman, uh, 2.4 million or between 2.3 and 2.4 million encounters is different than 2.3. But I think you're missing the point of the question. If, How if many may, have been released into the United States? Congresswoman, if I may, because you are mistaken, factually mistaken. So your data is incorrect. No. No, you are, um, you are misunderstanding our data. No. If I, okay, I'm going to reclaim my time because based on the information from your website, from your website, from your department, officially there have been, of all those encounters, 1.4 million, and that's a conservative number, that your department states have been released into the United States. So I know you guys have done this really fun uh, renaming, rebranding thing, calling it enforcement removal proceedings. But today, in fiscal year 22, you have now released over 1.4 million illegals into the United States. And my question to you now is, can you guarantee that none of those people have criminal records? This enforcement work is not fun, Congresswoman. This is a noble profession in which People risk their lives to conduct it, and you know that very well. All the righteous indignation. Here we go. So I want to make sure that you understand that per your own data and statistics, they have pointed out that, in fact, you hold the record as Secretary of Homeland Security for the most encounters and subsequent releases into the United States in history. Your own former boss, Secretary Jay Johnson said that a thousand a day is considered a crisis. Today we're encountering 7,000 a day. The facts and figures make the point for me. So is the border secure based on your feelings or facts? Congresswoman, um, let, me, um, let me have the opportunity to uh, correct a misstatement. Uh, 2.3 to 2.4 million encounters includes the fact that under Title 42, the Public Health Authority, individuals can actually um, be repeat offenders. They can try again. And so there are actually approximately 1.7 million unique individuals whom we have encountered at the border. So when you say- well, Based on point, your, your reporting- I, I'm, I'm actually- Based on may, your reporting, these folks are here in the United States and you, there's been no proper vetting of these people. And then we don't even have the agreements in place to deport the folks that you're claiming under Title 42. Nicaragua is a great example of that. Congressman, um, I, I hope you realize that we have removed or expelled more individuals from the United States uh, than uh, ever before. And just to clarify as a final question, you with all of this data that has been presented based on your own department's releases, you still believe that the border is secure? The gentlewoman's time has expired. You may answer the question, Mr. Secretary. Congressman, uh, Congresswoman, uh, we remain committed to enhancing the security of our border every single day. That's not an answer. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from New Jersey, Ms. Watson Coleman, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to the witnesses we're hearing before us today. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, I wanted to ask you a question about Coast Guard operations. Our country faces many pressing threats across the domestic and international landscape, several of which we've discussed here today, obviously. However, we must not lose track of threats we face over the long, long term, such as increased aggression by China and Russia within international waters. 
China is aggressively pursuing increased influence across the Indo-Pacific, and a Coast Guard cutter recently found Chinese Russian ships carrying out joint maneuvers in the Arctic, less than 100 miles off of Alaska. Mr. Secretary, how important to the U.S. interests are the Coast Guard's efforts to counter Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific and maintain a rule-based maritime order? And likewise, how critical are the Coast Guard's plans to build and acquire new icebreakers to enable increased maritime presence in the Arctic? Congresswoman, thank you very much. Uh, it is vitally important that our United States Coast Guard be fully resourced to address uh, what we all um, uh, today have described, uh, and uh, accurately so, as an only increasing threat uh, from China and other adverse nation states. I was actually in Singapore and Japan uh, several weeks ago uh, to speak about uh, the need to enhance our security partnerships and one of the uh, main lines of effort uh, in my bilateral discussions was in fact uh, increased cooperation with our United States Coast Guard uh, to address the increasing threat in the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, the United States Coast Guard also has an Arctic strategy that it is executing, and that Arctic strategy includes um, increasing uh, its aging fleet and replacing some of its most uh, aged um, uh, vessels. And so we look forward to Congress's support uh, for that necessary funding. Are there any other resources that we should be considering uh, to support you in, in that endeavor? Congresswoman, um, we, um, we of course have pre presented uh, our fiscal year 2023 uh, budget, which includes much needed resourcing of the United States Coast Guard. We do hope that our budget uh, is implemented very quickly. Every day that passes um, uh, fails to advance our security uh, mission, and we are of course working on our budget plans for the years beyond. Thank you. Um, I want to just uh, mention that I am totally in support of the questions raised by uh, Congressman Swalwell as it related to anti-Semitism. I mean, New Jersey has had a very unique experience just a week ago where uh, someone was threatening synagogues in the state of New Jersey. We have a large a Jewish population and we want all of our population to be safe. So to you and to uh, Director Ray, we very much look forward to your your, your diligence, your intelligence, and your um, pro-action as well as reaction. Finally, um, I have exactly a minute and 34 seconds left. I'm, mis I'm wondering, Mr. Mayorkas, if you had any follow-up response to the former question or questions that you've been asked that you'd like to share here. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, uh, thank you so much. You know, um, uh, we maintain uh, data with respect to the challenge at the border that uh, that data uh, informs our operational actions, and it's vitally important uh, that um, that data uh, be cited uh, with precision and accuracy. Uh, we demand that of ourselves uh, so that the operational decisions that we make are best tailored to address the challenges that we confront. I look forward to working in a bipartisan way with this uh, committee uh, to, uh, to address the myriad of threats uh, that we as a country face and to really enhance the security of the American people in every regard. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. LaTurner, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Secretary Mayorkas, in April, you said, quote, our message has been clear that the border is, in fact, not open. According to public data from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which you yourself oversee, we had 227,000 migrant encounters at the southwest border in September of this year alone, bringing the yearly total to almost 2.4 million, which is the highest number ever recorded. Do you believe that indicates a border that is not open? Uh, Congressman, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, please, um, it's very important that the American people understand that the individuals whom we encounter uh, who are not uh, expelled under the Public Health Authority of Title 42, are placed in immigration enforcement proceedings and are subject to removal if they do not qualify for the relief that the laws of this country 
provide them. Respectfully, I do not Mr. Think, Secretary, if I may. I, I, no, hang on. I have a limited amount of time and several questions. If you just give me a quick answer, I would really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, among those nearly 2.4 million encounters, we had 98 non-U.S. citizens listed on the terrorist watch list who were caught trying to enter the homeland between ports of entry. This is approximately five times the number of terrorist encounters from the last five years combined. Do you believe this indicates a border that is not open? What this indicates, uh, Congressman, is the fact that we have extraordinary personnel in the United States Border Patrol risking their lives every day to apprehend individuals um, at, at the border. And Mr. we Mr. Work Secretary, in, in fis you're not going to answer the question. In fiscal year 2022, we had an estimated 600,000 gotaways. Do you believe this indicates a border that is not open? Um, uh, Congressman, I, I would um, respectfully posit that I don't think that the 1.4 million people who were either removed or expelled um, Mr. Secretary, the country would please. consider the border open. I'm going to take back my time. Uh, in May, Kansas City law enforcement seized more than 15,000 counterfeit fentanyl pills. This fiscal year alone, CBP has seized enough fentanyl to kill almost 2.9 billion people, over eight times the entire population of the U.S. Do you believe this indicates a border that is not open? Uh, Congressman, do you realize that the uh, majority of the fentanyl that is sought to be smuggled into the United States comes through the ports of entry, and our interdiction efforts have been more successful than ever before? I should note, Mr. Secretary, that in my year home state, over year excuse me, Mr. Secretary, you've done this all day. When you don't like a question, you filibuster. In my home state of Kansas, the state health department saw a 54 percent increase in drug overdoses in the first half of 2021, nearly half of which were caused by fentanyl, primarily supplied by the cartels. Nationwide, the CDC reported that over 107,000 Americans died of drug overdoses in 2021, with 66% of those related to synthetic opioids like fentanyl. 300 Americans a day are dying from fentanyl. It's the equivalent of an airliner going down every day. Do you think this indicates a border that is not open? Congressman, the, the fight against the scourge of fentanyl and the devastation that is, it is wreaking is a years-long fight that we in the United States government with our state and local partners have been fighting. Do you realize that the number of deaths from the number of overdose deaths from fentanyl has been increasing year over year since at least 2018? Certainly, this is not a new phenomenon. Mr. It Secretary, is, it is you not clearly, a new tragedy. Mr. Secretary, you clearly don't understand the problem. I clearly this do. Has, excuse me. This has nothing to do with politics. This is about kids across the country dying every single day from fentanyl overdoses because people in Washington can't get their act together. This is about an overwhelmed border patrol. This is about migrants being victimized by the drug cartels. I, my concern and the concern of my constituents back home is how can you begin to solve the problem if you don't even acknowledge the depth and breadth of it? Here's a, a question for you. I would have you had discussions, excuse you. me, Mr. Secretary, have you had discussions with the president or anyone in the Biden administration about stepping down from your current role? I have not. Not, not a conversation with anyone in the administration. Congressman, let me be very clear. Yes or no? May I answer your no, question? You, yes or no? Have you had that conversation with anyone in the administration? I am very proud of what we have accomplished. I'm very committed Sir, to accomplishing Answer more. the question. Have you had a conversation with anyone in the administration about stepping down from your current role? I have not. I hope, for the sake of the safety of the American people, that that conversation happens very soon. I yield back my time. Um, the Madam, Madam Acting The gentleman uh, yields back. Mr. Secretary, you may respond. If you Madam want. Acting Chair, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Congressman, I look forward uh, to sharing information with you so that you understand the threat that fentanyl poses uh, and how it is um, smuggled into the country. Everything that we are doing to fight the transnational criminal organizations across the federal enterprise with our partners to the south and to disabuse you of uh, misunderstandings that you have with respect to the fentanyl crisis, because they are grave. And I look forward to not only sharing information with you, but hopefully sharing information with the American public. Thank I recognize you. myself or for five minutes. Uh, in the ranking member's absence, I do want to thank him uh, for his leadership and his civility. Uh, I am hoping that this committee, uh, moving forward, uh, understands the importance 
of both of those things. Um, I've, I've heard a lot today and seen a lot, but there's one thing that I uh, just cannot ignore, and I don't have to. Uh, the performance of the gentleman from Louisiana earlier uh, was an embarrassment. And I am hoping that it was not reflective of the caliber of this committee and the very important work that you all have to do uh, between the members and staff uh, moving forward. Uh, I See, I just happen to believe that uh, we can, in the interest of the country, be our better selves. I just happen to believe that we can, on this committee, be examples of America's exceptionalism, that example for our children and our grandchildren, and I just happen to believe that we can work to keep our homeland safe uh, all at the same time. Uh, Director Ray, um, in June of 2019 or somewhere around there, uh, you talked about uh, that you had, the FBI had elevated the racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism to your highest level or highest threat priority. Uh, on the same level of ISIS and homegrown violent extremists. Is that still uh, the case today? Why or why not? Uh, yes, uh, Congresswoman, it is uh, still a national threat priority, and that's reflective of the lethality that we saw over the years leading up to that designation and that have, to some extent, continued since then. And where, how does the caseload uh, for cases falling into that category look today? Uh, I don't have exact numbers here, but I can tell you that the number of uh, both domestic violent extremism cases in general has been growing over the last four or five years. Would you say uh, it's doubled? Uh, it depends on when you, what your starting point is. Last five but, years. But it, it, it before uh, the end of calendar year 20, it had gone up by say 50%, uh, and since then it has gone up yet again quite, quite substantially. And that's domestic violent extremism overall, of which racially and ethically motivated violent extremism is one part. But I should say that along with racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism, we also saw starting in 2020 and continuing to the present, a lot of anti-government, anti-authority violent extremism, which includes everything from militia violent extremism to anarchist violent extremism. And while that hasn't resulted in as many lethal attacks, the sheer volume of it caused us to uh, elevate that as well, more recently, also to a national threat priority. Would you say that that is the result of a lone domestic violent extremist? You talked about the threat of, I, I used to say the lone wolf, I guess we don't say that anymore, but would you say that the increase that you just talked about is a result of these individual people out there who are influenced by an array of different things? We, we are certainly seeing a trend uh, that is magnified online uh, of people using a mix, uh, a hodgepodge of different uh, personal beliefs and ideologies and grievances to, uh, as justification for violence. And that is an alarming trend that has continued, again, for the last let's say four or five years. Um, and it's something we have to be concerned about. And certainly the, the social media dimension is one of, the, uh, one of the ways in which gasoline is poured on the fire, if you will. But there are a lot of other things that contribute to it. You've also said that China and Russia have basically piggybacked on the unrest that's here, the division within our country. What did you mean by that? In what ways? Well, a, a number of, of our foreign adversaries, a number of nation states, uh, Russia initially, but since then, not just Russia, but China and Iran as well, uh, have capitalized on the same toxic, uh, politically charged violence that occurs in this country these days to try to pit us against each other, to sow divisiveness, to amplify tensions that are already there and make it worse. And we yeah, saw they that must not be, just with Russia. They must be smiling uh, right now. Let me, let me just end with this. I want to thank um, all of you for the commitment that you have to protecting our nation. 
uh, you have tough jobs. Someday I wonder why uh, you've answered the call. But on behalf of this committee, we are sure glad uh, that you did. At uh, this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Meyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses who are here today. Um, I know we all prize truth and accuracy, and, and one thing for Director Abbasad, before we begin, Mr. Swalwell had mentioned the Iranian parliament voting, I think he said, uh, the death penalty for 15,000 protesters. Is that, strictly speaking, an accurate statement that he made? I don't have details on exactly what the Iranian parliament actually did. Um, we can certainly get back to you on that. I mean, I will say in the spirit of this question and in the spirit of Director Ray's response, the Iranian government is a state sponsor of terrorism. We've seen them pursue multiple different inroads into the United States and elsewhere. And, uh, and it is a regime that raises significant concerns from a security perspective. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the public reporting that I had seen said that the Iranian parliament had voted in a supermajority to um, enact tougher, swifter punishments up to and including the death penalty. But I think it's important when we're talking about adversaries to be clear. And then again, I know you are well aware of this from your own work, um, but I just want to make sure that those statements and, and exaggerations don't go um, don't go unanswered. And I guess on the realm of that notion of exaggeration and jumping to false conclusions, um, you know, Secretary Mayorkas, the September 19, 2021 incident in Del Rio, Texas with the three mounted CBP officers. Um, can you, I know you had initial statements defending them last year. There were then um, you know, a little bit of a walking back and, and President Biden making some very sweeping assumptions accusing those officers of using their reins to whip uh, or otherwise um, physically assault migrants who were coming across the border illegally. Uh, and then over the summer, there was an investigation that essentially, uh, I believe, clarifying that it was cord split reins that were being used to control the horses. They never came into contact uh, with the migrants or the migrants didn't come into contact with those agents uh, in that sense. Do you have anything else to add, you know, in terms of your current assessment of that situation now that we're a year and change onwards from it? Congressman, uh, uh, thanks so much. Um, from the very outset, mm -hmm. I was actually in Del Rio uh, the day that um, those uh, photographs and um, uh, were uh, first published. Uh, from that very afternoon in Del Rio, um, at a press conference, and ever since, I have spoken of the fact that the facts would be adduced in an objective, fair, and thorough investigation mm -hmm. conducted by the Office of Professional Responsibility. Um, the career personnel of the Office of Professional Responsibility did indeed conduct such an investigation, and their thorough and extensive report speaks for itself. And I believe those there are still three CBP members and a supervisor that are currently in an investigatory process. So they haven't, it, is that an accurate understanding? I'm just using media reports because there hasn't been too much. Uh, uh, Congressman, um, uh, to be precise, uh, yeah, to, your, to your point, I believe the investigation is concluded, the report has been submitted, and now the disciplinary process Correct, yeah. is underway. And that can take some time because, of course, uh, the agents are afforded due process rights. And, and I, I appreciate hearing that because so often the narrative gets far ahead of the facts and by the time, you know, the, the erroneous tweet gets a million likes and then the correction follow-up gets 15. Right? Making sure that we're applying that same standard in a 24-hour rapid news cycle is important as the narrative gets baked in and people have a misunderstanding, misapprehension. Um, I guess very quickly, because I'm running a little bit out of time, the four Secret Service agents in April of this year um, who were found to have been uh, taking gifts, uh, free apartment rentals, uh, a number of, of kind of high value items that were being given to them by individuals that they believed were DHS agents, Department of Homeland Security agents, but were instead just uh, cosplay artists, I mean, characters who were ingratiating themselves and, and all credit to the United States Postal Investigation Service that uncovered it. Um, is that essentially a personnel matter? Because that is the response that the department has been giving to our committee when we're inquiring how such a glaring security lapse could occur. So, so Congressman, I can't speak to the, the facts because they are uh, under review. There's a, there's a process 
there, but I can say this with tremendous conviction that I am intensely proud of the men and women of the United States Secret Service and the manner in which they execute uh, their mission. And I am you. a beneficiary of their willingness to risk their lives for the safety and security of others. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, for five minutes. So my, my question is directed toward the director. Um, I'm the future congressman for Riverdale in the Bronx. Riverdale happens to be home to the Russian diplomatic compound, which stands as one of the highest buildings at one of the highest points in the Bronx. It's both literally and metaphorically a structure of surveillance towering over the Bronx. Uh, the compound is so shredded in secrecy that not even the fire department could gain access when a fire broke out more than a decade ago and according to a retired FBI special agent, Robert Dreek, it's an open secret that there are Russian spies disguised as diplomats residing at the Russian diplomatic compound. In 2015, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District arrested and charged Ivgeny Barakov with conspiring to act as an agent of the Russian Federation on American soil. Mr. Barakov lived in Riverdale in close proximity to the Russian diplomatic compound. Uh, so in the FBI's view, does the Russian diplomatic compound pose a homeland security threat? Well, Congressman, I, I think we may have provided a, uh, a classified briefing to you on this topic, um, but if, if we can supplement that, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I will say that the uh, Russian intelligence services uh, are perhaps the most active and aggressive here in U.S. soil, and in no place more so than in the city of New York. And would you consider that a homeland security threat? I, I consider the Russian intelligence services activity here in the U.S. to be a homeland security threat. Uh, under the Foreign Mission Act, uh, the FBI has the authority to reject on homeland security grounds the sighting of a new embassy or consulate. Uh, Section 4305D2 reads as follows, quote, after December 22, 1987, real property in the United States may not be acquired by or on behalf of the foreign mission of a foreign country if in the judgment of the FBI director, the acquisition of that property of that country uh, might substantially improve the capability of that country to engage in intelligence activities directed against the United States. Do you think the Russian diplomatic compound in the words of the Foreign Mission Act substantially improves the capability of Russia to engage in intelligence activities directed against the United States government? Well, I'd, I'd be more comfortable taking this up uh, in classified session. I, I'm not an expert on the legality uh, parts of the interaction here, but I, what I will tell you is that I know that the FBI's concerns from a counterintelligence perspective with respect to the Russian intelligence services are something that we discuss with the State Department, which has an important role here uh, quite frequently. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work, for example, that we were able to do to, together to ensure the closing, for example, of the San Francisco consulate uh, for many of the same kinds of reasons that you're alluding and, to. And I just want to be clear, I'm not asking for confidential numbers or information. I'm simply asking, you know, does the public have a right to know the FBI's view on whether a compound in their backyard poses a threat to the security of the homeland? And that can be answered without divulging highly sensitive information. Well, I can answer in a general sense, which is that we are concerned about the Russian intelligence services activity in the U.S., including in New York, and their ability to exploit their diplomatic presence to accomplish that. More than that, I think I would have to wait and, and have us brief you on that, as I think we have to some extent already in, cl in closed session. Uh, and it's not because I don't absolutely, as somebody whose parents still live in New York, <laughs> Uh, care deeply about the issue that you're concerned about, but I just want to be careful about how I answer the question. You know, suppose the Russian diplomatic compound had never been built in Riverdale in the 1970s. If the Russian government were proposing to build the Russian diplomatic compound today, would the FBI reject it under the Foreign Mission Act? Well, I'm reluctant to engage in hypotheticals other than to say, as I've said, that we have seen a long history of the Russian intelligence services abusing and exploiting their diplomatic presence in the U.S., including in New York, 
uh, for purposes that are not in the interests of, of the United States. And we will continue to express our views fairly forcefully in the interagency in that regard. I suspect the answer is no, uh, that we would never allow this structure of surveillance to be built in 2022 in Riverdale. And the fact that you know, espionage in the Russian diplomatic compound has essentially been grandfathered in is as indefensible to me as it is inexplicable. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Pfluger, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So we have the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, and the Homeland Security Departments here, the three agencies that have largely been entrusted with the safety and security of uh, every American has entrusted your agencies with their safety and security, and this is your legacy. Th this is the legacy that you're going to leave behind. It's already been mentioned today that this year we have 98 people, and that doesn't include the nine Secretary Mayorkas that were reported by your department yesterday in October. So over 100 people have matched the terror watch list. 100 people. That's a 500% increase from the encounters of previous year. And regardless of your testimony today, under oath, that your testimony today, that our border is secure, Americans can look at the numbers. We can look at the numbers right here and see from 2017 to 2021 and all the way into 2022, fiscal year 22, over 100 people matched the terror watch list. All of you have testified today that you're worried about terrorism. Really? And you, you see here the gotaways. And Secretary Mayorkas, you've told me several times under oath that we have operational control of the southern border. And I assume that you maintain that because you testified earlier today. How many of these people match the terror watch list? How many of the 600,000 known gotaways match the terror watch list? Congressman, uh, your, your question points to the very reason why we prioritize national security and public safety in our immigration enforcement efforts. Why? Mr. September Secretary, can I reclaim just a minute? I'm going to claim, reclaim my time. I think that is false. I've been to the southern border, and I've talked to your Border Patrol agents. And you know what they tell me? That on any given shift, 70% of them are relegated to administrative duties. They are not in the field doing the national security mission. How many of these 600,000 people, can you assure the American people that not a single one of these 600,000 people are a threat to our safety? That they don't match the terror watch list, that they're not part of a criminal or transnational organization? That's what your agents have told me personally. So I, I'm just taking their word for it. I have the benefit of a vantage point of uh, what the entire border uh, mm. presents, as well as what we are doing about it. One of the things that we've done about the fact that Border Patrol agents were too often Secretary, answer, answer the question. Processing. How many of the 600,000 people? No, we have two minutes left. I know, but I, I feel compelled to. You don't have the time thing. to do that. I want to know how many of the 600,000 people match the terror watch list. Well, um, uh, Congressman, by definition, they are gotaways. Okay, so you don't know. And so how can you say that the border is secure? It's, it's, the American people aren't buying it. We're not buying it because the deaths that are happening in our communities, I've invited you to come with me. I was in Del Rio the day before you got there when the 15,000 Haitians were there. I've been to El Paso. I've been to the, the Rio Grande Valley. You're going to hear more on that later. Let's put up another slide because you're not going to answer that question. But I don't, while we're putting up the next slide, while, while we're putting up the next slide, do you maintain that we have operational control of the southern border? Uh, uh, Congressman, let me just say one thing um, very briefly, and then I'll answer your question. <laughs> it is very difficult to answer your question when I'm not given the opportunity to do so, number one. As my colleagues have said. Two, and number two, I do feel compelled to correct inaccuracies that are contained in your question for the benefit of the American people. The, the accuracies the, are, the, the, the facts that I have stated are reported by you uh, and uh, your department. Congressman, so we are dedicated to resourcing the United States Border Patrol with additional personnel, okay. with the, additional technology, using barriers advisedly where they are most beneficial. Okay, that, that's not my to question. To deliver 
enhance security. Mr. Secretary, thank you for, for that. Um, I've heard you say, and President Biden, and, and, and this is your legacy, okay? The American people can count. We can count. There's a humanitarian crisis at our southern border. I've been down there. You and President Biden have continued to ignore this problem. And fiscal year 22 was the deadliest year on record. More than 800 migrants died. Do you remember the 53 that died in a tractor trailer in the heat of July, south of San Antonio, Texas? This is the legacy. The American people are demanding that you secure the border. You have testified under oath today that it is secure. It is not. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, for five minutes. And let me just uh, remind the members that we do have a vote on the floor. Um, five minutes is five minutes. You're all entitled to it. But just know that there is a vote on the floor. Mr. Gottheimer. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I've called for a national carjacking car theft task force as a result of a rising number of car thefts impacting my district uh, in the state of New Jersey overall and of course the nation. However, these threats reach our ports as well. According to CBP's own reporting, thousands of vehicles have been illegally exported through tri-state area ports, including port of the Port of Newark, bound for overseas destinations including West Africa and the Dominican Republic. Last year in New Jersey, there were more than 14,000 vehicles reported stolen, a shocking 22% increase compared to 2020 and 2020 numbers are already up from the year before. Year after year, these crimes continue to grow. There's been a 19% increase in New Jersey through the first eight months of 2022, including uh, in the county in my district, Bergen County, has seen a 54% increase in car thefts this year. I've called this committee to hold a hearing on the issue of auto theft and port security, as well as for Secretary Marcus to appear to answer questions about DHS's failing to take what I believe are adequate steps to address this issue. I believe DHS must do more to crack down However, I'm concerned this issue is not being addressed in an urgent matter from the department. Mr. Secretary, uh, despite repeated efforts, officials from DHS have refused to answer my questions or publicly speak out on what measures are being taken in response to these alarming numbers of stolen vehicles being uh, taken to our ports. Uh, I reached out to your office multiple times over multiple months to invite you or a senior official from DHS to come to Jersey to address this issue, and you were refused, which, as you might imagine, is very frustrating for the people that I represent. Clearly, it's a serious issue. Can I ask you, Mr. Secretary, do you think this is a serious issue? Why aren't you communicating more to the public? Um, why aren't you taking more serious steps? Uh, and uh, what is your plan there? Uh, Congressman, um, uh, forgive me, I'm unfamiliar with your request to, uh, to speak with me directly about what is clearly a um, uh, homeland security issue. I would be pleased uh, to speak with you subsequent to this hearing, and I will um, uh, proactively uh, reach out to your office. Uh, I was um, I was actually in uh, one of our ports on the East Coast, uh, working uh, with our Homeland Security Investigations and our uh, uh, Customs Officer uh, personnel, um, addressing stolen uh, vehicles and the implications for our security, uh, the effort uh, to smuggle uh, narcotics through our ports of entry in stolen vehicles and other methods. Uh, and I can share some insights in that regard and also learn from you with respect to uh, the methodologies that you think we should employ to address um, uh, this uh, criminal threat. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, just so you know, we, I personally left messages for you. We reached, spoke to your, uh, the departments at Homeland. They refused to come despite repeated requests, uh, and which was very frustrating because it was over many months. This has been a, a huge challenge, and I think this should be front and center as an issue that uh, you consider. And I hope that somebody, I've seen in addition to our conversation, from DHS will come to the port to actually investigate, to look, to see what other steps can be taken, working with local and state law enforcement to address this issue. So I, I hope that will happen. I hope that I have your word that that will happen, please. Sir. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, if I can turn to uh, Director Ray. Uh, in October, uh, Director, I helped host a full committee field hearing on countering violent extremism, terrorism, and anti-Semitic threats in New Jersey. The ADL's audit of anti-Semitic incidents reported uh, a rec uh, record 2,717 acts of assault, vandalism, and harassment, average of more than seven incidents a day of anti-Semitic incidents in Jersey, up 25 percent 
in the last year, we have a huge issue. And just recently, the FBI uh, alerted the state and warned of a threat, uh, a broad threat to synagogues for which an extremist individual was ultimately arrested. It's a, a clear reminder to the Jewish community and place of worship are vulnerable. Director, what's the FBI uh, doing to counter anti-Semitic threats and violence in New Jersey and around the country? If you mind just addressing that, please. Uh, absolutely. I'm obviously pleased that we were able to make an arrest uh, in the case in New Jersey that you mentioned. And I was actually speaking to all of ADL uh, on this topic just last week, uh, more broadly. Right. And uh, certainly anti-Semitism and violence that comes out of it is a persistent and present fact. Uh, numbers that we've seen about 63% of religious hate crimes overall are motivated by anti-Semitism and that's targeting a group that just makes up about 2.4% of the American population. So it's a community uh, that deserves and desperately needs our support because they're getting hit from all sides. And we are trying to address it uh, through a combination of things. One, on the terrorism side, the domestic terrorism side, through our joint terrorism task forces. Uh, two, on the hate crime side, through our civil rights program. We've elevated uh, that to a national threat priority. Uh, we've created, third, a, a domestic terrorism hate crime uh, fusion cell, which brings together those two programs that I just mentioned, domestic terrorism and hate crimes, to try to be more uh, proactive, uh, and in fact, that uh, fusion cell has already had results. We uh, uh, were able to uh, bring a proactive hate charge to prevent uh, an intended attack on a synagogue uh, in Colorado as a result of it. But then on top of that, we're engaged in a very aggressive outreach campaign uh, that's designed to kind of raise awareness, help people know how to report, what to be on the lookout for, uh, because we need to tap into the eyes and ears uh, that are in the community. And that has included, for example, not far from you uh, in New York, uh, translating some of the materials uh, into uh, Yiddish, um, uh, for example, in Hebrew, to make it more accessible to uh, certain parts of the Jewish community. The gentleman's time has expired. So the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary and the Director, Director, for coming today. Uh, I want to start off first uh, with Ms. Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, fiscal Year 21, 2021 National Defense Authorization Act, which was uh, enacted January 1st, uh, directed the administration to develop a continuing of the economy plan. Uh, as we came upon the one year, and they were supposed to finish it by the end of this year, as we came upon the one year mark last year, I sent a letter to you as well as uh, Director Easterly, uh, expressing you know, my immense concern about the lack of progress. I never received a response. Uh, then 15 months after the, the uh, authorization was done, uh, the president finally handed over the authority to CISA, pretty much setting up the, uh, the agency for a failure. Uh, we're now over a little bit of a month before the deadline, and we have yet to receive any information on where CISA or the department is on the development of the continuation of the economy plan. Uh, and again, we sent that a letter and we still have received no response. Uh, you talked about cybersecurity in your opening remarks. The development of this uh, continuation of the economy plan is a national security imperative for the safety, security, and prosperity of the US economy. So can we please have an update where we are on the development of this plan, which is due in less than two months? Uh, Congressman Garbarino, I'll, I'll look forward to following up on that for you and responding swiftly. I'll have to look into that. When, well, where, I mean, where, the, um, where the report that is due to you is. Okay, I, well, it's, the report is due in two months, but we, I've sent two letters both to you and uh, Director Eastley, and I've received no response at all. When can I expect a response? Uh, let, me, let me follow up with you very quickly on that, uh, Congressman. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I, have, I have another question uh, for you, uh, Mr. Secretary because you also talked about it a little bit in your, uh, in your opening statement. Earlier this summer, Canada became the last member of Five Eyes Intelligence Pooling Alliance to bar or restrict the use of Huawei equipment within its 5G telecom network. In addition, Canada's ban also includes equipment made by ZTE, which is one of China's biggest tech companies and one that is state-owned. The United States and Canada work in partnership at uh, and beyond our borders to enhance security, sharing critical infrastructure. So it's critically important that the U.S. can trust Canada's or any other allies, 5G equipment and software will not threaten our national security, economic security and privacy or intellectual property. As the world becomes increasingly connected via the rise of 5G networks, 
How can vulnerabilities brought on by other nations' 5G networks, such as those with Huawei equipment, uh, how, can we, uh, how, do they, how can we make sure they don't pose an, a national security risk? Uh, Congressman, your question is so very important. Let me, let me share with you, number one, uh, Canada uh, uh, is a very, very close security partner with us. We have a robust information sharing architecture with them. Uh, they are one of the participants in our regular dialogues in um, the area that you have identified and in so many other homeland and national security areas. I was just in Singapore uh, about three weeks ago speaking about the very issue that you've identified and really um, communicating a very clear and stark call to countries in the Indo-Pacific region about the vulnerabilities that are created when we allow uh, China, the People's Republic of China, uh, to um, control some of the architecture. Can I ask you what their response? Such as 5G. What was their response when you brought that? Because we, we're already doing it, but our allies, you know, there's, there's some of them that aren't doing it and some of them that will have not updated. You know, they put these plans in place and they haven't updated current infrastructure with, uh, with Huawei technology. Uh, uh, Congressman, it is our responsibility to communicate information, to communicate accurate information with respect to the perils um, uh, of having infrastructure, communications infrastructure in the hands of nation states that don't um, uh, uh, protect freedoms and rights as do we. Okay, well, I, I think though, if these, if some of our allies are not willing to, uh, you know, protect their vulnerabilities like we are, especially with Huawei, we should, uh, uh, we should maybe be a little more careful in the future to sign what we're gonna share with them just because, you know, we don't need the enemy knowing uh, what we know. Uh, and I have a final question for Director uh, Ray. Um, according to an August 2019 UN report, North Korea has generated an estimated $2 billion for its weapons of mass destruction program using cyber attacks. Then uh, again, we had just in April, North Korea hackers uh, st stole $620 million in cryptocurrency from video game Axie. They are you know, they've been doing this for a very long time and, and they're getting a little aggressive. What are we doing to uh, stop these hackers? Uh, or, you know, what, what actions have been taken? The gentleman's time has expired. The witness may answer the question. Well, you're right that I think uh, North Korea sometimes gets, uh, and I think dangerously so, overlooked as a significant cyber threat because we spend so much time, very rightly, talking about China, Russia, and Iran. But North Korea has a growing uh, espionage in addition to theft and attack capability, in some ways sort of similar to Iran in recent years in particular, uh, and especially targeting, as you say, financial institutions, cryptocurrency exchanges, and so forth, because they need it to fund uh, their regime because of the effectiveness of the sanctions that are otherwise exist. So we are actively investigating any number of North Korean threat actor groups uh, when we're able to catch somebody who's working with them in a country that we can extradite from. Uh, that's a very important part, uh, both in terms of ensuring accountability, but also in terms of disrupting their efforts and in terms of learning valuable intelligence about their techniques, tactics, and procedures. And in addition to that, it helps us figure out how to further tighten the sanctions regime to make it harder for them to find loopholes, uh, which they're always looking for. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Flores, for five minutes. Thank you, madam. And uh, thank you to Chair Thompson and ranking member Katko for holding this hearing today. Um, to all the witnesses, thank you for taking the time uh, to speak to us today. We really appreciate it. Our country is currently facing never before seen levels of illegal immigration, drug smuggling, and child sex trafficking. To Secretary uh, Mayorkas, as someone who lives the reality of our southern border every day, by saying that the border is secure, we're lying to the American people. According to the CBP, our country has experienced 2.7 million migrant encounters to our border during the fiscal year of 2022. This does not include the 900,000 Godaways. Further, there has been 98 people apprehended crossing the border who appear on the terrorist screening data set. This administration's horrendous border policies will continue to threaten our national security because secure border is national security. This week has been a very difficult week for us in South Texas. Our border patrol agents, the ones who dedicate their lives to protect us, 
are not receiving the support that they need from this administration. One of the top things I've heard from our Border Patrol agents across the southern border is the lack of action from the DHS leadership in addressing Border Patrol morale. Our Border Patrol agents are understaffed, not provided with the resources that they need to succeed, and are spending time processing asylum claims instead of doing the job that they signed up to do. Tragically, in the last week, in the RGB sector, two Border Patrol agents took their own lives, leaving behind families and creating a hole in our um, communities. Question number one, as Secretary Mayorkas, the historic level of illegal aliens apprehensions and crossings at the border combined with the limited resources and personnel to handle the large influx of migrants has caused a steep decline in morale among the Border Patrol workforce. In no other department is a mental health crisis more visible than Customs and Border Protection, Border uh, Patrol Division. Our agents and our officers, one life is, is too many, and in one week. What are your plans to support the mental health for your workforce and address the troubling increase of suicide among the frontline personnel? Congresswoman, may I have a minute to answer your question because you've touched on very, very important matters. And I first, at the outset, should thank you for your service because I know you have a Border Patrol agent in your family, and I know very well that the, it is the family that serves. Mm -hmm. um, um, our prayers and thoughts are with the families of the agents who uh, took their lives. Um, our Border Patrol agents, our heroic Border Patrol agents, mm -hmm. are indeed under intense pressure and under in, in, indeed under intense challenge, and we are very dedicated to providing them with the resources and support that they need uh, to fulfill their responsibilities and to ensure their wellness. That is a commitment that we have, and it is an unwavering one and our highest priority. We have surged resources to the border to get more Border Patrol agents out in the field. We are taking it to the smuggling organizations and the transnational criminal organizations in an unprecedented way. We are working with our partners to the south, uh, the countries that need to enforce their borders and enforce their laws of humanitarian relief. This is a challenge that is not specific to the United States, that is not specific to our southern border, that is something that has gripped the Western Hemisphere. Let me take the example of Venezuela alone. There are approximately 25 to 28 million people in the country of Venezuela. Approximately 8 million Venezuelans have left their country. Uh, Colombia is hosting 2.4 million Venezuelans. Chile is reported to host over 1 million Venezuelans. That is not, and it is not Venezuela alone. Costa Rica is hosting hundreds and thousands of Nicaraguans. We are seeing a migration in the Western Hemisphere and in fact across the world that is unprecedented. There are more displaced our border, but with respect to our border, please rest assured, Congresswoman, and please have your family rest assured that we are dedicated to enhancing the security of our southern border and taking care of our extraordinary and brave personnel who secure it every day. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses uh, for your testimony and the members for uh, your questions. The members of the committee may have additional questions. record will remain open for 10 uh, business days also that there is a vote uh, on the floor. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Nano three so that our TSOs can not just become a part of the federal system per se in terms of pay scale, but 
uh, we need to treat them like we do the majority of other federal employees, and, and this would be a, a way to do it. Uh, they would receive a 30% increase in pay mm -hmm. uh, right off the bat uh, if if that bill passed, and that challenge you're having probably in Reno might not. Uh, your member here, uh, Ms. Titus, has uh, been very, very helpful uh, to us in that situation, uh, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, I was impressed with um, how they, uh, the TSOs, uh, took pride in explaining yeah. the technology. Um, and, you know, I felt kind of bad saying, but we really ought to be paying you a little more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how you really appreciate an employee. You pay them. And so I, I, uh, I, I we all support that. Um, Mr. Martell, uh, COVID-19 uh, has affected uh, the ability to process international travels. How has CBP uh, uh, addressed those challenges? Sir, in internally, um, the CBP has worked very closely with DHS and with HHS to establish um, protocols in terms of keeping our employees safe, keeping um, keeping our employees well informed on social distancing protocols, acquiring personal protective equipment, hand sanitizer to ensure that all the employees operating within airports, seaports, and land border port have the equipment that they need to not only keep themselves safe, but to keep travelers safe. We've also worked with port authorities, with, with um, facility managers, and disinfecting our, our workspaces.